in real life. Good, great, thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk. Uh, good morning, I call this uh, public hearing of the General Law Committee to order. It's uh, March 1st, uh, 2022, little uh, 10.03 a.m. Uh, Chairman D'Agostino will be joining us uh, shortly, uh, but before he does, I just wanted to see if uh, Senator Whitcoast, uh, the, the ranking has anything to say. Uh, good morning, everyone. Looking forward to today's public hearing uh, and then ready to proceed, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And uh, Representative Ritigliano, would you like to welcome our newest uh, member to the committee, Representative uh, Pizzuto? Yes. Uh, welcome, Bill. Uh, we look forward to having you on the committee. Like we said before, this is a great committee. It's truly bipartisan. Sit back, listen, learn. And uh, when we're together tomorrow over the next few days, we'll go over how things work and and sort of get you acclimated, but welcome. You couldn't have picked a better committee to be in. Thank you very much, Representative. Thank you. Yep. Great. I think we'd all like to echo uh, his welcome and welcome you to the committee. And we look forward uh, to working with you. And with that, uh, Mr. Clerk, can we call our first speaker, uh, James Yacobellis from the Connecticut Hospital Association? Good morning, Senator Maroney, Representative Tigliano, Senator Whitkos, and Representative D'Agostino and other distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. Uh, my name is Jim Macabellis. I'm the Senior Vice President of Government and Regulatory Affairs here at the Connecticut Hospital Association. And I'm pleased to testify this, this morning in support of HB 5224, an act concerning standards for interpreters for, for the deaf, deaf blind, and hard of hearing individuals. Since late last summer, CHA has been part of a work group organized by the Human Services Committee on issues related to the deaf, deafblind, and hard of hearing community. Um, this group was led by Representative Abercrombie, Representative Comey, and Representative Fusco. This bill and a similar one raised in the Human Services Committee addresses several of the issues we discussed. First, the bill expands the definition of medical setting for interpreters to clearly include both physical and mental health. Second, it requires the Department of uh, Aging and Disability Services to categorize interpreters on their website by the interpretive settings in which they are credentialed. Uh, currently, the website lists interpreters um, alphabetically, this will categorize them by the settings in which they are credentialed, more helpful to the public and individuals who are needing uh, of need interpreters. Thirdly, the bill requires the Department of Aging and Disability Services to create a web page. And on this web page, to detail the services that are available for deaf, deaf blind, and hard of hearing individuals. They are to work with the Department of Social Services, the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, the Department of Children and Families, and create a single web page with all of the services for all of these agencies, which can be posted on all of the agencies' websites. This is important for the public. If you're looking for services related for a person who is deaf, deaf, blind, or hard of hearing, and you go on DCF's website, this will allow you then to see services that are available for DEMIS, for the Department of Aging and Disability Services, as well um, as the Department of Social Services. It's, it will be consistent information across um, the state agencies. Extraordinarily important. One of the issues that we spent time talking about um, and what is was to create um, a central agency or place where individuals looking for services can go. This was this is a way in which to do that. And finally, um, it expands the uh, the interpreter pool in Connecticut by uh, allowing individuals who are credentialed by the Massachusetts Commission on the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Uh, we support. Um, uh, House Bill 5224, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I see Senator Whitcoast has his hand raised. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, James, for coming this morning. Uh, just a couple of questions. You said that if somebody went on the DCF website, uh, they would maybe see a list uh, there. And I, I thought there was a list in the judiciary um, that is um, kept there as well for services that are available. How many, if there are more than one, 
uh, lists are you aware of in the state? Well, I know that each, each agency has on its website, I know the Department of Aging and Disability Services does, we know DEMIS does and DCF does, but they don't, they don't sort of cross connect, right? So if, you, if you're going to look at DCF and you realize that maybe uh, you're looking for someone who is aged out of, out of DCF, um, you then would have to go back into the, find the page on the, on the DEMIS website. Um, so this would connect all of them. I don't know exactly the number of um, state agencies. The goal was here was to de develop a list. And I think you're right. The judicial department probably should be part of this as well. And so do you, who do you envision to be, how I envision it would be a singular list uh, that is maintained by some entity in the executive branch and that there would be links to all the, from all these other agencies that bring you back to the one master list. Because if we have too many lists and they're not being updated, it could cause more confusion than it's worth. So would you be supportive of something like that? Actually, I think that's, that is the goal. That's exactly the goal here. So it's, the, it's consistent information across state, state agencies. It'll take one state agency, and here it's the Aging and uh, uh, Disability Services to sort of create the same list, which could then be posted on a variety of different state agencies. But you're absolutely right. That, that is the goal here, and we, we are supportive, excuse me, of that. And in your experience of having traversed the multiple state agencies, is there one agency that's doing a better job of keeping the list up to date than other ones? Because maybe, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to hear we need additional resources when we're just talking about a spreadsheet basically being updated. So um, which agency are you aware of that does a better job of keeping a, a current list? I, I think during this work group, we actually considered that question and thought it, the best one was the Department of Aging and Disability Services, who, uh, who has um, some significant responsibilities um, in this area. So that's, that, that was the recommendation of this uh, sort of um, work group, but I think um, it was one where we're happy to have conversations, uh, and I know the Human Services Committee would be as well. Okay, great. Thank you. That's all the questions I have, Mr. Chairman. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Whitcoast. Are there any further questions? Uh, Senator Kissel. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I don't know if this goes to the person testifying. Good morning, sir, or, or to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, since uh, Senator Whitcoast did bring out that the judicial branch, a uh, separate branch of government, probably has this up and running as well. I'm just wondering who in the committee, perhaps yourself, Mr. Chairman, uh, or our clerk would reach out to them. Uh, I know that they're very willing to, to work with any kind of problems or issues, uh, but just to make sure that this committee reaches out to the judicial branch uh, and gives them a heads up so that they can be brought into this discussion to get this uh, more holistic since we have the train running in front of us right now. Uh, and as the ranking on judiciary, that just sort of popped into my head. It's an excellent point. Uh, thank you uh, for bringing that up, uh, Senator Kistel. And I will uh, circle back with you uh, to tomorrow <laughs> when we're in session, we see each other in person and uh, we can figure out how to proceed uh, with that. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank uh, the, the speaker and, and the working group as well. This is really a great initiative and so many people out there that need this uh, I don't even necessarily want to say, a, 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 I mean, it is assistance, but, but it's critical to, I mean, it's hard enough to get through the government system. And if you're, you have difficulties with hearing issues, uh, it can be that much more difficult. So it's really critical uh, to uh, serving the public that we all want to serve as best as possible. So thank you, sir. Senator Maroney, thank I should you. have also thanked the, uh, uh, Representative Vitigliano, who I know has been working with his caucus in support of this as well, um, and been coordinating in with the work group. But thank you for them because these are important issues. Yeah. Echo the thanks uh, to Rep Representative Vitigliano for his work on this. Are there any uh, further questions? Okay, hearing none, thank you very much uh, for coming to testify uh, before us. Thank you. Okay, um, <clears throat> typically uh, we go in the order with the uh, pub public officials first. I know we did 
deviate slightly because we have a, a translator only for a limited time. Uh, however, uh, I would like to go next to uh, the Department of Consumer Protection. So we'll call up uh, Maureen Magnin uh, from the Department of Consumer Protection next, and then we'll uh, resume with the uh, everyone testifying on Bill House Bill 5224. Mr. Clerk, if you can bring Maureen into the room. Hello, Senator, I'm here. Um, Senators Maroney and Whitcoast and Representatives D'Agostino and Ritigliano and all the members of the General Law Committee, thank you for uh, taking the time to hear from me today. I'd like yes, to hold on a minute. Go ahead, Maureen. Go ahead. Okay. I would like to um, talk to you about four bills today. You have my written testimony, so I won't read it all. Uh, the first is Senate Bill 186, which is the Collaborative Drug Therapy Management Agreement and Policy Bill. Uh, and we have been working with the proponents of this bill. We, uh, we do support it, but we want to let you know that uh, this will require additional staff resources at our department uh, in order to implement the expanded area of practice. Uh, Senate Bill 187, an act concerning cottage food operations. Uh, currently, there's an annual gross sales cap of $25,000 on cottage food operations, and this bill would double that cap to $50,000. Uh, we're not taking a position on the bill, but we do recommend that you talk to the Department of Public Health and the local departments of public health, since doubling the cap will uh, obviously put more food into um, direct sale to the consumers without any local permit. Uh, House Bill 5222, an act concerning paid solicitors of charitable funds and charitable organization transparency. Um, section one of this bill is in response to the recent United States District Court ruling on Kissel v. Siegel last month, which uh, stated, which ruled that a number of the um, things that we require for um, paid solicitors of charitable funds are uh, violating the First Amendment. So this section one would address those concerns and put us in line with the new court ruling. House Bill 5223, an act expanding the professional assistance program for regulated professions to include pharmacists. Uh, this bill would add licensed pharmacists to the professional assistance program for regulated professions under the Department of Public Health statutes. Um, while we support including licensed pharmacists into this program, we would request that um, you put this within our statutes so that we could best manage the program. And um, also, we would also have to set up an assistant, a professional assistant account there at DCP. So it would just be easier for us to manage it if we're in within our own statutes. And we are reaching out to the proponents of this bill to talk about amending the language to make these changes. Uh, and that concludes my remarks. I don't know if there's any questions. Great, thank you, Mike. Uh, very much. I do see a, a few questions. We're going to go in the order and so start with uh, Representative Acker. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ranking Member uh, Dave, for taking that out for letting me jump ahead of you. I didn't know I was right. at the. Totally okay. uh, uh, Maureen, thank you for being here. A couple, uh, hopefully, uh, easy questions. Um, the first one on the cottage food business. Uh, how many do we have? Like, are they registered with the state of Connecticut type of thing? And how many do we have? Um, you know, I would have to get you the specific numbers and get back to you on that. Okay. 710 representative. Oh, 700. There you go. I missed the, the beginning part. How many? 710. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so then I, I'll ask Dave offline, maybe further questions. Sorry about that. I, I had to go look myself, to be honest with you. Okay. 
I was just wondering, curious how many were pushing that limit to begin with, you know, um, and then is the, I take it there's regulations, uh, Maureen, with the local health districts to oversee these operations. I would imagine that's correct, right? Uh, they are, they, there's no required permit for them with the local health officials right now. So uh, they, they would not be monitoring these businesses. Okay, thank you. Because I saw some of the testimony that was in support of this legislation, but it sounded like in those other states, there was some type of local, um, but I'll, I'll ask those uh, individuals that um, later on on that one. And then the, um, the second one was a bill that uh, uh, I have been working on, and that is the one regarding charitable donations. Mm -hmm. And it was essentially a paragraph, one page bill, now it's 12 pages. Uh, so it's, uh, you talked about some uh, court hearing, I believe, or uh, something that passed that had made you move in this direction. It seems like uh, in certain areas that it's, um, I want to say, a little less transparent. It was a 20-day requirement and, uh, for them to submit an application, submit information to you. The department now it's down to one day. Can you just, what's the genesis of this again? If you could explain a little bit more for me. Maureen, I'd be really appreciate it. Sure. Uh, the genesis is really the, the United States District Court ruling. It's saying that the 20 day uh, component of our law was uh, in violation of the First Amendment, along with several other parts of the law. So we are just merely re, uh, redrafting based on this court ruling. I think I thank you for that uh, information. Uh, I'll look forward to more dialogue of this and work with the committee on this one. So thank you, Maureen, again. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. I can just, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, just just to weigh in with uh, Representative Acker. This is a from a committee standpoint. His his uh, bill from last year is bolted on to uh, what the department wanted and what the AG wanted with respect to the entire charitable statutory scheme so there's a combination and that's why this is grown we just we put all the concepts under one under one umbrella it was not, it was not meant to metastasize his bill into something into something larger thank you mr chair uh representative retigliano thank you mr chairman uh good morning uh maureen how are you today Good morning, Representative. I had a, a quick question about your statement about the um, the managed care for the pharmacist. When you say you want to put it in your department, you don't want to. Uh, what exactly are you saying? Are you saying that you want to handle how how this works, or or you just want to handle how the money gets transferred to the company that does the managed care? Uh, we are. The way the bill's drafted right now, it is specific to uh, the, the public health statutes and not to the DCP statutes. So we would prefer that the pharmacy statute piece of this be amended uh, into our, our statutes. Right, but the pharmacy licenses are held in DCP, not public right. health, right? right. Yeah. So really what this would do is, in my opinion, I think, I have to, you know, maybe there's some, we have to fix the legislation. It's supposed to allow the pharmacist to participate in this program, this rehabilitation program, but really DCP would have to put a fee or divert some of their licensure money to pay for the program. Mm -hmm. Are you saying you're okay with that? And, or do you actually want to manage the, the uh, uh, assistance program? We, we, Haven would still manage the program. It just would be from, it's just merely just a drafting issue so that we could best uh, oversee the program and make sure it's implemented. All right, thank you. That clears it up. And on the cottage food industry, I, I was mm -hmm. really hoping that the Department of Consumer Protection could take a position because um, some want the cap eliminated, some want it doubled, some want a little more than doubled. Um, I know there is an inspection or a regulatory issue. Uh, that maybe there's some concerns in the department, but I thought maybe you guys would take a, a more definitive position on it. Well, I can certainly uh, go back to our people and talk to them and, and get back to you if, if to kind of give you a, a more clarified position. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Representative Cheeseman. Thank you. I didn't know whether you wanted to call on Senator Whitcoast before you call on me. I don't want to 
jump the queue here. Um, it's okay, I'm, Holly. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. I'm um, just quick question about 186. I see from your comments, it's very much a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's also mention of the requirement for additional staff to implement this program. Um, I wonder if you could just expand on this. And I, again, I'm sort of curious why this would be with you instead of uh, Department of Public Health. So those are my questions. Um, okay. So uh, we would need additional staff resources um, because um, because we'd have to do additional investigations and, and tracking. It would be a drug control agent that we would have to add to our staff. Um, and I, it's with us, I think, because of our overseeing of, of the pharmacists. Okay, but it, as I say, from the, the, certainly your testimony, what we're seeing now is not necessarily what's going to be the end product because conversations are going on Correct. between all yeah. the interested parties. Yes, and we would also have to approve all the plans that would come forward. So that would take the, that would be the addition. Also, the drug control agents' additional duties. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Senator Whitkos. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Maureen, uh, two quick questions. One is regarding the Cottage Foods uh, 187. Now, the only thing that the TCP does basically is just license the business. Is that correct? And then DPH, since it's a food uh, issue, handles everything else. Or do you guys do inspections on those as well? Um, one second. Let me check on that. And, I, and I'll say that the increase in the numbers, like kind of, I have a concern with Dave too, that has maybe moving the cap because with the cost of inflation, everything going up in prices that it doesn't actually, there's going to be some um, more product out on the streets, but who knows to the degree of how much more. Okay, D, DPH is not involved in this program. We do um, everything around in, involved in the program. I, I thought you had mentioned something in your testimony about DPH. That's why I just threw that out there. <clears throat> Could you? Uh, well, we were suggesting that, you, that the proponents of the bill just talk to DPH because they um, are because they aren't involved in the program. They won't be aware that all this additional foods coming in onto the market and, and being sold. And do you, does your department? Um, consult or correspond with them when there's a new cottage food industry that has been licensed at all? No. All right, so if we're not even doing it for a new new business that comes out and is selling food product, why would we do it for an existing one just if they're able to sell more of their product? I think uh, just because it would be uh, increasing the amount of food that's gonna be direct sale to a consumer without uh, DPH's knowledge or involvement. Okay, and I was disappointed that the department did not um, testify to Senate Bill 188. Uh, that's been some uh, been before us uh, before in the past, and there is always an issue uh, surrounding federal um, uh, a, a conflict between federal law and, and state statutes. And I was wondering if you could offer some insight into that. Uh, I did read the testimony of, of um, the pharmaceutical uh, companies that that have. Mm -hmm. submitted written testimony and they're saying it's not needed because the federal law uh, is already in place that provides for that and that it, the the way the bill is drafted it would currently conflict with a federal law yeah well we didn't we aren't taking a position on that bill except to say that it would be an additional couple of violation which again would require additional resources uh, needed at the department well, I'd like you to go back uh, and offer some comments on the validity of the argument, if you could, um, since you oversee the, the pharmaceuticals in the state, to, to, to let this committee know whether it would be in conflict with federal uh, statutes or not, because I think that's important for all of us to know. Okay, Senator, we will uh, we'll get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Whitkos. Are there any uh, further questions? Mr. Chair? Okay. Senator Kissel has a question. Oh, Senator Kissel, please proceed. Yeah, I still have a master that 
automatic hand thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, I just I have to compliment our our hearing interpreter that I'm watching uh, when Representative D'Agostino throughout metast- metastasized. She didn't even blink. So that's like incredible. Uh, <laughs> the other thing is, uh, you know, it's, it's great that we're making these strides in Connecticut since we have the school for the deaf in West Hartford. And so we're sort of preeminent as a state. Uh, and my understanding is I was I'm just throwing this out there for our, all of our edification is that uh, Alexander Graham Bell actually did a lot of the initial research. I think his wife and mom both had hearing issues. Uh, and thus we have the telephone and thus we can hear each other on these, these Zoom meetings. So a lot of it started with uh, people that were hearing impaired. But my, it, 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 my one question is, the name of that court case on the home solicitation, could you just say who the plaintiff's name was again? It was indeed Kissel, Senator Kissel. But, uh, like spelled the same know. way? Yes, K-I-S-S-P-L. Well, well, I just for the record, it's not me, but... <laughs> uh, I'm going to go look into that and find out what that's all about. And yeah, that's well, a- it did take me a few uh, times <laughs> of hearing about this to make sure it wasn't Senator Kissel. <laughs> well, legislators Adam. do bring lawsuits, but uh, I've been sort of busy to do that one. <laughs> yeah, I've got my, my whole thing is home solicitation. It's like going door to door, fixated on that. Uh, and is that a Superior Court case? That didn't go up on appeal, did it? No, not yet. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kissel. In full disclosure, I did Google the case after <laughs> to see if it was uh, see if it was you. And so I was from a California court case. Ah, so. uh, there we go. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any further questions? If not, uh, thank you for your testimony. All right, uh, thank Lori. you very much for your time. And then I believe uh, Representative D'Agostino, Co-Chair D'Agostino, I believe you're going to take over at this time. For a little while, uh, Chairman Maroney, we'll, we'll switch back and forth. Thank you for starting us off today. Uh, so I think following your lead, Mr. Chairman, the idea is to go back to testimony on 524, is that right? Correct. Okay, and so Mr. Clerk, who do we have next on 5224? Is that uh, Ms. Nzinga? Correct. All right, Sandra and Zinga. Apologies. She should be in now. And I can see you, Sandra. There you are. And make sure you're unmuted. Hello. Yes. Good morning. All right. Um, so I am. I am deaf. So you might be confused as to why you're hearing the interpreter. <laughs> um, but she will be speaking for me. So you'll get to see, you know, the interpreting process in full today. My name is Sandra Nzinga, and I am from um, Bradford, or Branford, sorry, and I'm the uh, president for the Council of Organizations Serving the Deaf, sorry, CCOSD. That's who I'm representing today, but I uh, have also been working on the governor's advisory board for the deaf and hard of hearing. So um, that provides technical support, consultation to all of you, representatives and senators, the governor um, on issues regarding deaf and hard of hearing populations. So in regards to this bill 5224, this is something that's been in the works for several years. Um, And we're trying to get it up to date to be consistent with current practices and policies regarding sign language interpreters and their legal requirements um, to be able to work. And, you know, it's very difficult uh, when one might not have exposure to the field of interpreting or have not utilized interpreting services often. Um, And that's why we really wanna make sure that we clarify some points in this bill so that folks are able to have a better understanding of what is required of an interpreter. Um, I think this is 12 or 13 times that the bill has been revised so far, but we really wanna make sure that it is current um, and meets all of the current standard practices and requirements. So the bill um, in and of itself is a good bill. And I think, or I'm sorry, 
uh, Bill Icabellis had made some good points about categorizing the interpreters on the registry because they do specialize um, and there are specialized requirements for certain fields of interpreting and having those visible to the community would be very helpful. Um, however, there is one category of interpreters called community interpreters um, and that's more of a broad scope so the interpreter you're seeing today is working as a community interpreter. She's not here as a legal interpreter or a medical interpreter. Um, so community interpreting jobs would include pretty much anything that is not medical, legal, or educational. So job interviews, various meetings, board meetings, et cetera. Now, um, typically community interpreters, because the statutes regarding them are so ambiguous, um, they haven't been included in the law as clearly as necessary. Um, and they do have requirements still, but they uh, aren't stipulated as clearly as they need to be. Being out in the community, they do still require a certain skill set because they have quite an impact on a deaf person's life. So I just wanna go back and make sure that those issues are clarified in the bill. And we would like to recommend <clears throat> making sure that mental health interpreting is also clearly reflected under the medical interpreting field. Um, there has been an increase in focus on mental health services in general, and that goes the same for deaf folks as well. Uh, those needs are increasing as well, and the access to those services is extremely difficult, um, especially when interpreters are involved. We need to make sure that they are very competent and qualified to be a third person in those one-on-one -on -one settings, know how to work with a deaf person in those settings. So we really wanna make sure that those are stipulated clearly in this bill. Um, I also want to, you know, bill 5224 is uh, very similar. You, Zinga, just a heads up, you, you're, three, you're at the three minute marker. So if you can start wrapping up, please. Sure, there was another bill, 5230, uh, which is very comparable to this one. Um, I think they would complement each other as well. So I think maybe we could use both of those to, or use that as a reference to clarify this bill. So thank you so much, um, especially to Representative Rutigliano for sponsoring and being a proponent of this bill. Thank you. Um, see if I, if I do this right, is it? Yeah. Just saying, are there, if there was any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. And, and again, so see, like, thank you. Did I do that right? <laughs> All right, good. Um, yep, you got it. <laughs> I, I'm sure we're, we're going to have some questions. Let me just, uh, I do want to just note one thing, just based on what you're saying about wanting some modifications to the bill. Uh, Representative Ritigliano, if maybe somebody from House Republicans' office could liaise with the council and Sandra and get their red lines, we could we could work directly since I know some, some of your folks really had the pen on uh, this bill and we could try to get that for JFS language. But if we can't get it in time for JFS, certainly I'm sure we've got a commitment from the committee leadership to uh, revise the bill appropriately working, working with the council. Um, Senator Wickos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question is uh, specific to the bill wherein you say that you want to incorporate those licenses in Massachusetts to be able to practice in Connecticut or be on our list. And the question is, is there a difference in licensing in Massachusetts versus Connecticut? Well, Connecticut actually has no licensure requirements for interpreters um, whatsoever. The only thing that we rely on would, is the National Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf, who is the certifying body and the governing body for interpreters, but we don't have any state screening process, any state licensure process. Um, so only those who are certified at the national level um, are able to work in the state, but there were problems at the national level with their screening process. So that did sort of cause a hiccup in our process for a little bit there. Um, there were interpreters who were trying to become nationally certified, but couldn't due to the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf having issues with their testing and revising their testing. Um, but that's the only current qualification for interpreters to work in Connecticut because we don't have our own process as sort of a backup. 
and Massachusetts why, does. Well, then why would we limit it just to Massachusetts? Why wouldn't we incorporate Rhode Island and some of the other uh, New York's, our neighboring states? Well, not every state has uh, a state screening process. Um, we know that Massachusetts, their commission, um, they have a state screening process. We've worked with them quite a bunch and they, uh, we feel that their process is sufficient. Rhode Island doesn't have a state screening. Um, there are other states that have their own screening process. Florida has one, for example, but um, many people feel that it's not reliable or robust enough um, compared to Massachusetts. It really doesn't ensure that interpreters are meeting the minimum qualifications to be able to work. So we did try to establish um, a standards committee who could provide some oversight um, if there were someone to come into the state or be willing to work in our state from another state um, to provide some type of evaluation or something like that to make sure that they were meeting the minimum standard qualifications. But it wasn't something that was that was viable. No, but it didn't pass at the time. Um, it was sort of a big issue and it would require, you know, a number of resources of people to be involved to provide that oversight, but we don't have our own process like that because um, that was removed from our bill proposal. That, that's shameful that we, we don't have something like that here in our state and that uh, we, we look towards our neighbors to the north um, where they're set. Uh, how, how does one get on the list whether they're a, a medical interpreter. I know you spoke of a, uh, a legal interpreter and now maybe a community interpreter. Do they have to do any type of screening or can they just apply to have their name on the list to provide those services? So currently in order to register as an interpreter with the state, um, you register through the Department of Aging and Disability Services and you must register every year. Um, and you have to provide credentials in order to be put on that registry, which would be the national certification um, that I had mentioned earlier. But right now they don't list the specialized certificates. Um, if one does work in the medical field or the legal field, they don't make mention of that on their registry currently. It's really just a list of names and contact information. So we are proposing that we have a more detailed registry so that folks can have a better idea of the specific qualifications for interpreters. And is it is it normal for some an interpreter <clears throat> to register every year? I know we do that in Connecticut, but is that an industry standard? Um, it seems to me it may be uh, somewhat of a roadblock to have to do something like that every year. Uh, that's something we've had in place in the state, I think for eight or nine years. And it seems to have worked thus far. It's only limiting in the sense that we don't have um, all of that detailed information available. We see their name, whatever certification they hold, which might articulate fully what it says, or it might be an acronym, but it doesn't go into that specialized information. And do you have to pay for the registration on an annual basis? Is there a fee? I don't believe so, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator Kissel. Yeah, there's no fee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, I wanna make sure I get this right. So it's Ms. Nzinga and Ms. McKenna. And first of all, I wanna compliment both of you because I was thinking about this and it's not just sort of being bilingual in a way of hand, uh, speaking with your hands and uh, hearing the language because it's simultaneous. So that's a very heightened skill set. I mean, you, there's no time for delay. Uh, and also the other thing that you brought out, I want to compliment uh, both of you, but at, at Ms. McKenna, by the way, very nice to hear your voice, beautiful voice. I always see you, but I never hear you, uh, is that, yeah, for different specialized fields with different vocabularies, uh, you know, I mean, 
it's difficult to understand, let's say, if you just get a physical, right, from your physician, he may start using or she may start using terms that are not familiar. But for you folks to interpret this for the for the hearing impaired, now that's my that's essentially my question. Uh, I'm using hearing impaired, but is it still, for lack of a better way of phrasing it, politically correct or appropriate to use deaf? Uh, only because I try to be sensitive to these things. I mean, you know, you're not disabled, you're physically challenged, that kind of thing. So I'm just wondering, how is it appropriate for us to discuss people that have hearing issues or are deaf? Is that still okay? Yes, uh, generally speaking, um, people who have, you, you can speak very generally and very broadly using the term people with hearing loss. Um, however, we as a community choose to identify as deaf, deaf blind, hard of hearing. Um, I will caution you that hearing impaired is actually the less politically correct term. Um, and I sort of cringe when I hear it because I certainly don't feel impaired in any way. Um, but yes, deaf uh, is fine to use. But again, if you're speaking very broadly, you can say people with hearing loss because that will sort of cover the gamut. Now, Okay. As you were mentioning about the interpreting process, yes, thank you for bringing that point up because it is important to emphasize that American Sign Language is not English on the hands. It is a recognized world language with its own grammar, its own syntax, its own rules, etc. cetera, um, just like French or Spanish would be. So when you see um, an interpreter working, for example, like you mentioned, going to a physical, it is a team approach of all three individuals, the patient, the doctor, and the interpreter, um, just to ensure that there is understanding um, and appropriate interpretation. Now, the interpreters not only have to understand the jargon of a particular field, but they also have to make sure that their language in ASL is appropriate for the individual that they're working with. Um, and ASL is a very visual language. Um, right now, I was just describing what a dentist might be talking about with your teeth. You use your hands to sort of depict which tooth you're referencing on the jaw. So uh, it's very important that the interpreters are not only fluent in the jargon and the English, but also equally fluent in the ASL. And you can see that ASL is also a bit more efficient because the interpreter is taking extra time here to get caught up <laughs> putting it into English. Wow. Well, you know, one thing I've learned as a senator over the years is there's never a bad question. And I, you know, if my, you know, and, and, and by the way, to our new representative, there's never a bad question. A lot of times you'll ask something, you may hesitate, but other people are thinking of that question. And it may seem extremely basic. Here I thought I was being kind or understanding or open-minded by saying hearing impaired. And that was like almost derogatory and it's better to say deaf. Unless I asked that question, I would never know. Uh, and to Senator Whitcoast's point, remember I was talking about Alexander Graham Bell. Well, part of his study of those with deaf uh, problems was on Martha's Vineyard back in the day, uh, the uh, 1800s. And at that time, they just thought it was like your mental state. And from that, he gleaned that it was family related and genetic. There were these problems. And so they were actually able to make great strides because if you were deaf, they might think you were slow and there's no intellectual hearing correlation. Uh, it's just your inability to hear would obviously cause you problems in learning. So he made studies of the people on Martha's Vineyard, not super mega rich. These are the fishermen that came over to that island. So the whole study of hearing and hearing loss and deaf people seems to be a, like a New England kind of thing and then sort of went west from, from up, up here in the Northeast. So it doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, I just want to thank both of you. I, the more I learn about this, the more I hope you know, 13, 14 years to get a bill through. I really hope this is the year we get this across the finish line. And uh, to the extent Representative Rutigliano has championed this, I wanna thank him as well and everybody on the committee. I'm with you, Senator Whitcoast, one of the best committees in the legislature by far. Thank you both so much. Thank, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Senator. Uh, looking for any more questions. Mm -hmm.
Oh, and I just wanted to say as well, notable about Connecticut is the School for the Deaf in West Hartford is actually the first ever uh, school for the deaf that was established in the United States. So it did serve as the model for other states to subsequently set up in their own as well. Um, Connecticut actually has quite a rich history um, in deaf education and in deafness. You can actually take a walking tour in Hartford and you'll see there are several references that you might not expect um, that go back to deaf education or to the school being established here. Um, yeah, so there's a lot, there's a rich history in our state for sure. Well, a lot of times we're hard on ourselves. So it's really great to know that we're number one in something and that we've championed the nation in, in a field that's really uh, very laudable. So thank you for pointing that out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further questions, I will uh, uh, thank you again for your testimony. Uh, I will. I just want to note again, uh, we'll, uh, we'll rely on Representative Ricciuliano and the House Republican staff to reach out to you with respect to further changes in the bill. And I want to note for you and for everybody, I think you all know this, in a short session, we do plan to move bills out of committee uh, probably in the next two weeks, probably by the 17th or so. So, uh, but there will be chances, uh, opportunities for further revisions. If, if we're still working on the bill with the council, um, don't, don't read anything into the fact that maybe we move this version out of committee we will sink into your comments and, and revise again on the floor. It's part of a process and we just have to meet certain uh, uh, deadlines. Uh, but I don't want you to, to feel that your uh, your concerns that you raised were, are being ignored. We're gonna uh, take a look at them and, and ask our staff to, to do that as well. So thank you, thank you again. Uh, Okay. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. You're also going to hear, uh, I believe Dr. Harvey Corson is next to testify um, and he's going to recommend some of the similar revisions I just did. And we will make sure that we have all of those submitted by the end of today. But thank you for hearing me and thank you for allowing me to share our experiences with this bill thus far. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, with that, Mr. Clerk, I think that's right. The next is uh, Mr. Corson on 5224. That is correct. He should be in now. There you are. Hello, good morning. So I'm just trying to pin him. Okay. Hello, good morning, everyone, to the esteemed members of the committee. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for the opportunity to speak today on this issue, House Bill uh, 5224. My name is Dr. Harvey Corson. And I am the chair of the Legislative and Education Committee uh, representing the Connecticut Association of the Deaf. I have already written and submitted my testimony um, online. I made sure to do that. I submitted it this morning, but I will briefly uh, state what was in my testimony in front of this committee today. So first I wanted to say that we are very pleased to see that the uh, recommended updates and revisions that were uh, within this proposed legislation are being reviewed, uh, especially concerning our involvement. Uh, we've had weekly meetings or monthly meetings, I'm sorry, for this working group. Um, and we work with the advisory board for the deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing persons. And we work closely with Representative Abercrombie who chairs the Human Services Committee. And we worked uh, very closely with her from August through December on getting these revisions in place. So I wanna say that the bill is wonderful. It's a great improvement from previous editions. However, there is one large omission I noticed. And that is that in bill 5224, there is no recognition or um, provision regarding community interpreting and it needs uh, there's no definition of what those settings entail 
So, um, currently, those interpreters might, uh, there are some other stipulated fields, medical, legal, education, um, and community interpreters need to be recognized as well um, within the deaf community in the state of Connecticut. Um, and they are nation, uh, nationally as well. So I would like to propose some new language that could be added to this bill to further define community interpreting. Um, it would be point number five in the bill and it could state community settings would be defined as any setting other than those uh, specially designated such as education, legal and medical. And it would include, but not be limited to uh, daily living activities, such as information sharing, employment, social services, entertainment, and civic and community engagement. So this proposed language uh, I'm proposing today, I believe would help further clarify community settings. Um, and also if you see on the next page, page three, starting um, at the point where it says, uh, it's line 83 and it says, and may begin with community interpreting and has met at least one of the following. Those following requirements um, would also further define those specialized areas, but you'll notice community interpreting um, is a broader scope than those specialized fields. Um, and those specialized fields do require further training. Like someone just mentioned the example of the medical setting earlier, a medical interpreter would have some basic training and knowledge on medical terminology. So that way they're, they're more able, they're more facile at interpreting in that specific setting. And obviously that's very important because it includes, you know, it could be life or death, right? It's very urgent matters at times and it could have great bearings on um, a deaf person's life. But the additional language that I'm proposing in terms of further defining community interpreting settings really will be a critical component um, for this bill. Uh, and it will me, affect- Mr. The... just a heads up, you're past your three minute marker. If you can start wrapping up, please. Sure, yep, and this, so it will further clarify and it will greatly improve the services um, in this state and making sure that all are in compliance with current statutes for interpreters for deaf, deaf blind and hard of hearing persons. I would like to thank all of you for um, listening to me today and for considering these revisions to this bill um, and this, pro this proposed addition to the bill in terms of defining community interpreting, thank you. Thank you. Senator Wickhouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I know that uh, the good chair has said that if um, our attorneys will be working on some revisions to the language, uh, but my question to Dr. Corson is, are you familiar with any state that already has the community interpreter language in it, say Massachusetts, for example, that our legal staff could look at uh, to, for consideration? Well, we um, we really need support our, our uh, we have a list of requiring in step of inside law in the national level. We call it the registry of interpreters for the deaf. It's a national organization that you know services it does the testing, sets up uh, standards. You know, you heard a while ago persons that we, we don't have state. Uh, you mentioned recently, you saw recently that somebody mentioned they don't have the uh, state analysis of what's the, the standard form here in Connecticut. I, I assume that Connecticut would have evidence of that taken from uh, jobs from other places as well, yes. But we, we have to follow the national uh, organization for consideration in discussing states. Each state has a different uh, uh, interest in, in their standards. And 
Massachusetts is our neighboring state. And we learned that some of their people, some of their uh, agencies that are there help afford avenues for, for and options for our interpreting uh, with, with that's why we have, we suggest we accept some of the Massachusetts guidelines uh, that will help increase the pool of interpreters in the state. I know that uh, working with some other states, other states have interpreting requirements as well, but exactly what they are exactly and word for word, you know, we can't discuss it this time because, you know, it's, a, it's it would take up too much time. Thank you. I, I know that uh, I just went online and I don't see Dr. Corson's testimony yet. Um, however, he provided what he thought would be a good addition to the bill. Is that included in his written testimony? Yes, it is. Fantastic. I've done that, Thank you. I've done that already. That's, that's what I've done. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> Senator Kessel. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question. A lot of times when you folks are talking, you're talking about hearing impaired, deaf, and then deaf blind. And I'm wondering if we're going to help make strides regarding sign language, how does that help an individual that is deaf blind since they can't see? Yeah, I understand your question. That's a a fairly good question. Um, I can answer you that deaf blind means that deaf and obviously they, they can't see it and at the same time. So it's really a, a, a horrific disability to have. And but when, um, when we found ways to over the years to circumvent that issue when uh, barriers are there, we don't want to invent and use uh, that was used done by Helen Keller, the events that happened there, uh, finger spelling the whole, all of the words, you know, finger spelling the, the words in the hand. But you can follow communication and signs. A lot of work, a lot of work for, uh, you know, the finger spelling of words uh, is involved. Tactile, in, you know, and, and haptics uh, is a form of, of helping with, uh, you know, for. A, B's, and C's, and you have ways of doing that. But because there's also many individuals who become deafblind and have signing from uh, uh, experience from the past, have more conceptual understanding of what language is, and therefore can communicate with their hands on the on the signs. So for so we have experience with with sign language that can visualize in their in their brains what the signs were were like from the from the tactile stuff tactile uh, hands and th that can move the message around message uh, effectively so they can communicate i don't mean to speak like an expert on deaf blindness but i because i'm not but i have worked with and i've communicated with deaf blind individuals you know, it's an individual, each individual can sign a diff, at different levels and tactically and whether they're, they're deaf blind, blind from birth or receive uh, sign language or uh, have a posture to see what signs sign language offers, that people are acting as if they met and they met the individual needs in communication needs. So they are able to meet those needs for those who are deaf blind. Well, th thank you very much, sir. That was very informative. And I just, I, again, I just can't thank uh, Rep. Tigliano and the leadership of this committee for moving this forward. I really, I know it's a short session. It may be a work in progress when it gets out the door, but uh, we will have, I mean, a lot of bills, they get uh, changed right on the floors of the House or the Senate. And uh, I just feel so blessed. I mean, it makes you appreciate all, all, all that God has given us. And I really think it's incumbent upon us to help those that have these challenges uh, to, to make the best out of their lives as possible. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, sir, for coming to testify. Thank you, Senator. Let's see if we have any other questions. And seeing none, I will thank you for your testimony as well. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And 
Mr. Clerk, do we have uh, anyone else on 5224? Um, that should conclude all um, testifiers for House Bill 5224. Okay, let me let me actually just ask if anybody's listening if we have any bills in the waiting just to make sure that any is there any other testimony on 5224? Mr. Chair, is yes, Representative Chair. Carney also testifying on 5224? I do not know. Mr. Clark, do we know, Sam? No, I had um Representative Carney on SB 187. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Representative Carney should be in right now. If I could chime in, Mr. Chairman, I was hoping that uh, Sam had a copy of that last gentleman's testimony because uh, it wasn't up on the system. I just didn't know if it was late or not. Um, yes, um, I so I have I have my, um, one of my I have one of my assistant clerks submitting testimony now, and it just takes a minute to upload. If you did it this morning, then that's probably why it was it wasn't up yet because we were just no. trying to organize everything. No problem, Sam. I just wanted to make sure we had it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Terrific. Okay, right. Well, I think that concludes the testimony on 5224. I, I think we will excuse our uh, intrepid interpreters. They can certainly stick around if they like, but we really appreciate uh, them sticking with us for the first hour of testimony. Uh, that was terrific. I hope we get to do that again, uh, just, just generally. Uh, it was very, very informative and very helpful to have them. So I want to thank uh, our interpreters for, for being here uh, to help with the testimony today. I uh, really appreciate the, uh, the committee um, working with us on that as well. So thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Representative Carney. Uh, good evening, or good evening. Good morning. Uh, good morning, <laughs> good morning yeah. Mr. Uh, General Law is not usually a 24 hour marathon, at least we hope not to be. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, Senator Maroney, Rep. Tigliano, and Senator Whitkos. Uh, before I go, I, I was just wondering if it might be possible uh, for me to be joined by uh, Jennifer McDonald. She may be in the waiting room, if that would be okay with the please, chair. Mr. Clerk, can you uh, let her in, please? I'm here. Oh, okay. There you go. All right. Perfect. Uh, so I'm going to let I'm going to yield most of my time to her since she's the expert in the issue. But uh, I do just want to say I am in strong support of uh, SB 187. Uh, I think removing or, or in this case, uh, increasing the cap would be good for the state, especially considering that all of New England and New York don't have a cap and that many folks during COVID uh, did do a lot of this sort of uh, cottage baking out of their homes when either their jobs were unavailable or they were home uh, with their children who were unable to go to school in person. So with that, I'm going to uh, yield my time to Jennifer McDonald. She is the uh, Assistant Director of Activism and Special Projects for the Institute for Justice. So thank you all. Good morning and thank you. Uh, at the Institute for Justice, we are a national nonprofit advocacy organization. Uh, that works with cottage food producers and supports creating opportunities for them so that they have an accessible uh, form of entrepreneurship. I'm also an expert on cottage on the cottage food industry, and I have published peer-reviewed re peer research that includes the first national survey of cottage food producers. So today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the importance of these businesses and what my research shows about that, and as well as what other states are doing to, to regulate them. Uh, we support SB 187. Doubling the sales cap from $25,000 to $50,000 is certainly a step in the right direction, but we would urge you to consider making some changes. Um, and I've outlined those in detail in my written testimony, but I'll just cover a couple of them uh, with you right now. The first thing we would like to see is the revenue cap removed entirely. So I'm sure you've heard from some of your constituents about how important their businesses are to them. Um, and I know that there are several of them that are gonna testify this morning about what removing the cap would do for them and their families. But what I can tell you from my research is that revenue caps on cottage food producers are increasingly becoming a thing of the past. Only 12 other states have a sales cap that is $50,000 or lower and 31 states do not have a cap at all. And that includes the rest of the New England states. Now, my research shows that these businesses are modest, uh, and most of them don't hit that type of revenue cap, um, but some producers do, and some really want to use their cottage food business as a way to test the waters before expanding into a brick and mortar bakery. 
So by arbitrarily limiting the amount of income they can make, it prevents them from scaling their businesses and really reaching their first potential, their uh, full potential, which is something that, especially with all the business closures due to COVID, uh, we know that cities and states are particularly interested in uh, fostering new small businesses and brick and mortar locations. Uh, the second request we would make uh, is to allow products to be shipped through the mail. Um, the current law does allow cottage foods to be sold online, but it requires that goods be delivered in person. Um, we're seeing a lot of people ordering products online, um, particularly through social media sites, because people want uh, custom products and they want to get them from you know, a, a small business owner. Now, allowing producers to mail their cookies to customers on the other side of the state would be a small change to, to the law, but it would be a huge opportunity for these entrepreneurs. And 35 other states, including your neighbor, Massachusetts, do allow products to be shipped through the mail. So to conclude, this language is a great step forward and we definitely support SB 187 and increasing the sales cap to $50,000. Uh, but we would urge you to consider making the recommendations that we've requested um, and making the cottage food law more expansive and giving these entrepreneurial activities to everybody throughout the state as much as they can. So thank you for the opportunity to testify and thank you Rep Representative Carney for giving me your time. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have about cottage foods in general. Thank you. Let me see if we have any questions for you. Senator Whitcup, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for testifying today. I know that um, it came up during an earlier uh, testimony about how many cottage food industries we have in Connecticut. I think Representative Vertigliano said upwards of just over 700. And my question would be, how is that uh, comparison to other New England states and across the country. Is this, are we in our infancy stage or is this kind of the standard you have based on our, the size of our population? Are we average or, or what other um, things can we can, what else can we do either remove barriers uh, such as what we're trying to do in this bill to kind of enhance and, and um, embrace cottage food? Sure. Um, my understanding is that that number for your population is about average. Um, it's difficult to know because, for example, in Massachusetts, to get a list of all of the people who are registered under this program, um, you have to request it from each health department throughout the localities. Um, so it's, it's a lot more difficult than just getting a statewide list. Um, but that's a, it's a pretty fair number, and Connecticut does have a really thriving cottage food industry. Um, and I would clarify, the reason that we know how many producers they are is because producers do need to register with DCP um, and they are regulated. So I think someone earlier said there's no license or registration, but there is. So we, we know who these people are and we can uh, look into any complaints or things like that with health inspections if we need to as well. And have, have there been any issues uh, in the past that you're aware of where there were uh, health issues or we weren't able to track down the origin of, you know, what say a, a botulism or a food poisoning or something along those lines? No, we haven't heard of anything in Connecticut. And in fact, we really haven't heard anything nationwide. So other states like Utah and Wyoming, North Dakota have uh, what we call total food freedom laws. So it allows them to sell um, foods that require temperature control and might be deemed potentially a little bit more hazardous than just your traditional self-stable baked goods that we're talking about today. Um, and even in those states with those really expansive laws, we're not seeing complaints of people getting sick from these items. Um, a producer's reputation is their entire business. And so they are fastidious in their sanitation practices to make sure that nobody gets sick from their products. And I haven't had the opportunity to read your uh, written testimony yet, but I, but I will uh, after the hearing. Uh, does it speak to the ability of uh, being able to ship the goods in there and with some potential language? Uh, yeah, so the, the change to the language in the current law would be um, pretty uh, a pretty easy um, change. So in subsection B of the law, it says that products produced by a cottage food operation uh, shall be sold directly to the consumer. Um, and it lists kind of some permissible venues and it says, um, provided that the cottage food operator uh, shall deliver in person to the customer within the state. Um, and so we would just cut that, you know, kind of personal delivery language so that they can ship through things. Um, that's what a lot of other states are doing, allowing ship uh, to ship through the mail. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, and I can get you specific language on that um, afterwards if you'd like. Yes, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Representative Oh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I did have a couple of questions. Um, when you said that the cottage food industry is regulated, they're regulated, but they're not inspected, correct? I mean, nobody goes into the home and inspects the, uh, the facility? Correct, yes. So, um, what most states do is um, they say, you know, look, this nothing in this law prohibits the health department from inspecting um, a cottage food business um, if they think it does need to be inspected or if there's a complaint about that that business. So, you know, I'm generally supportive of, of cottage food. I just didn't know, in your opinion, is there a certain business volume? When do we get to the point where you're producing so much food that you shouldn't be in your house anymore, and that you probably should be in one of these, you know, like a rental kitchen space or a communal kitchen, which are kind of popping up all over the place. I didn't know if you had in your experience when that person should be moving out of the house and into a commercial kitchen setting that is inspected and regulated and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. We find that the producers know um, when they're ready to move on to commercial kitchen space um, because there is a natural limit just to how much you can produce in your home kitchen. Um, the problem with a dollar cap is, um, you know, you can sell a lot more cookies than you can, for example, wedding cakes, um, which tend to get very expensive when you're talking about custom cakes. Um, so the producers know, you know, I want to expand my business and I can't keep working at this volume without a commercial space. And so we really have seen that it's kind of this organic process. Um, and the producers who are really expanding that far are really excited about getting their commercial license and getting to move into a um, brick and mortar kind of good situation. And are there any insurance requirements at all on a cottage food uh, business, somebody who, who bakes at home? And so if somebody did have an issue, some yeah, sort um, somebody so not specifically, I mean, really very few, you know, kind of retail businesses um, are required to have special insurance. Um, but we always tell people that, you know, we advise them to get personal liability insurance. Um, a lot of people do have that insurance. And a lot of people who sell at, for example, farmer's markets, the farmer's market itself may require that insurance. Um, so it, it's it's an optional thing, but we do see it as a very common practice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Representative Ackert, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that. Uh, Representative Carney and uh, and his guest. Uh, thank you for being here. Just a follow-up question, uh, similar. When we compare to other states, um, it seems like our state has a registration, but then they kind of the overseeing body rather than our local health or health districts. And it seems like the other states that were commenting on um, the state doesn't have the oversight, but the local health districts. Am I categorizing that correctly? Uh, yes and no. So some states um, have a, it's just controlled by the state public health department. Um, some states it's only controlled by the localities. So that happens in Illinois, for example. Um, and some states, which is I think what is most common is you see a state level registration requirement and then the responsibility for you know, maintaining a list of producers or investigating any inspections then falls to the local health department. So states like California do it that way. Um, we find that the, the, most, the more that it's concentrated at the state level, um, the better it is for everybody, particularly the producers, to understand what the requirements are and what their obligations are under the law. Okay, well, thank you, Jennifer. So then if we were to raise this cap, sort of say, uh, in this model, then uh, would we ask our local health districts to weigh in then on these uh, um, cottage businesses? Is that what would we then do? Um, as the law is currently written, it's uh, managed mm -hmm. by DCP um, and the local health departments aren't um, as involved with enforcement. Um, but that's something that could be looked at with the, the rulemaking process and just kind of depends on how DCP and the local departments um, kind of wanna, wanna work on that. And, and we'd be happy to weigh in on any sort of regulatory um, rulemaking process as well. Sure, I just always go back to that commercial where the young couple grabs that, gets a, a gift, says we don't even know how to bake. And next thing you know, they're like an enormous uh, cookie producer in a factory though. They kind of went, got out of the house and created it into a factory. So always supportive of a business, always wanna make sure the product that's out there is safe for consumers to eat though. So thank you, Jennifer, for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Further questions or comments? 
Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Representative Carney. Representative Carney, I don't know if he's clear to give you a last word if you like. No, I, you know, I just think this is would be great for the state. Uh, it's good for home businesses, and I hope uh, hope the committee will support it. I appreciate your time and for allowing me to yield my time uh, to Jennifer. Thank you, Representative. All right. Thank you. All right, back to the regular agenda. Sam, who's next? Up next is uh, Senator Slap. Good morning, everyone. Um, my, should I start? Yeah, you're all set. Thank you. Okay, awesome. All right, well, thank you uh, to the chairs, Representative D'Agostino, um, and to Senator Maroney and uh, distinguished ranking members, uh, Senator Whitcoast, Representative Ritigliano. It's good to see all of you and all the members here um, this morning. Uh, I am testifying in support of Senate Bill 189, and I do want to thank uh, the leadership of this committee for uh, agreeing to uh, to create and raise this bill and, and secure the bill. Um, and I have submitted testimony, so I won't you know read the entire testimony. I know there's others who are coming up before or after me, I should say, who are also going to be testifying in support of the bill, including uh, CHRO. Um, but I begin just with a, a very simple premise that um, women should not pay more for uh, goods and services simply because uh, they're women. And I think that most of our constituents would agree with that. And if we agree with the premise, then the question is, how do we, how do we get there? Because there's been ample uh, evidence and studies in, in, in other states and national studies, congressional studies that, um, that show that uh, women do pay this gender tax. It's often referred to as the pink tax. I'm not gonna call it that, but many of you may have heard of it um, with that name. It's, it's ubiquitous, it's significant. It costs women on average about $1,500 a year. Um, and so I think you know the time is finally um, here to address it. Um, interestingly, in my research on this, um, I discovered that um, you know this is not a, a new issue for this General Assembly and even for this committee. <clears throat> this committee in 1996 uh, approved of this bill. Uh, so did the Judiciary Committee, although it doesn't need to go to the Judiciary Committee. At least that's not um, you know my uh, uh, you know what I've looked at. I think it, it, it does not need to, but that's obviously up to the leadership of this committee. Um, and so anyways, this, this bill is, is, and the idea has been around, but a lot has changed since 1996. And I think we understand uh, the impact more of uh, pay equity and the gender wage gap. And we've done a lot as a body, as a general assembly uh, to help address that in, in a bipartisan manner over the last few years. Um, so I think this is a continuation of that where we say, you know, uh, women should not face discrimination um, in the workplace or in the marketplace. And other states have taken action. Uh, California has, New York just recently has as well. And, um, you know, I would say that this is also, I think, and I'm not an attorney, so full disclosure, but really a clarification of our uh, existing public accommodation law that, that does uh, deal with discrimination in, you know, in public places. And so, um, again, I think most of us would agree that women shouldn't be discriminated against um, you know, in any fashion, certainly when it comes to price discrimination. And we see, you know, evidence of that um, throughout our economy. And, you know, I'll, I'll just kind of wrap up by saying that there's a there's a way to do this where, you know, nobody wants to uh, punish or disadvantage um, our businesses. And I think that, that you also hear from, you know, CHRO about how their focus would be really on education. Um, and I think that's, you know, a great place for us to begin. And I would love to work with, with all of you and the leadership of this committee to be able to craft something where, you know, it isn't punitive. And, and in my conversations with CHRO, uh, we've been able to talk about a model where, you know, if we're, we're essentially, um, you know, the only penalty would be the price difference. So that's, you know, you're not talking uh, civil lawsuits, you're not talking, um, you know, our businesses being punished because we really just want to educate them. And I think being able to work together on, on a bill that would uh, change the law to make it clear that, you know, businesses can still have full discretion to price things however they want. It just can't be based on somebody's gender. And I think that's, that's the premise of this. Um, you know, been really grateful for your uh, agreeing to raise the bill and hear it. And, um, you know, I can stop there and happy to take your uh, your questions. So thanks again for your time this morning. Thank you, Senator.
questions for the senator? Senator Whitcus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator, for, for bringing the bill forward to us today. Just one quick question. Um, in doing the research for the bill, did you happen to, and I, I think it was either your testimony or CHROs that spoke about laundering services or somebody, somebody's did, uh, about why if you went to your dry cleaners, a uh, blouse is $2 more than a shirt. And did, did anybody do any homework to ask them why the price differential um, in basically providing the same service to something that's worn, you know, on the, on the top half of the body? I yeah, I mean, it, price difference. right. Some, yeah, I mean, sometimes it's based on you know the material, right, and and how much time it takes to uh, to to lawn or dry clean something, and those are all absolutely valid reasons to charge more. I think that's the point. It's just not based on when somebody walks through the door and you ascertain or you think you know what gender they are, and then say, "Aha, this is how much um, it should cost," based on that. So. Um, you know, under this uh, legislation, if it were to pass, uh, a dry cleaning business would have full discretion to say, look, silk blouses, as, as an example, you know, they cost more, than, you know, because of whatever reason, the machines or the time or the expertise, you name it, and they can still be priced. So, you know, businesses can recover the cost, make a profit, et cetera. I don't know if that, if that answers your question, Senator. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to wrap my hands around how something like that would be enforceable because obviously, you know, you go to a barber shop and prices for haircut are different than you go to, to a beauty salon um, to get um, your hair done. And how, how, do, how would we uh, or somebody make a complaint thinking that the price is, is gender related? If, if well, the most obvious, yeah. yeah. I, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. The most obvious example is you, you in many hairstyles places, they, they're very clear. They say this is the price for a woman and this is the price for a man. So um, th that's what this would be getting at. And I think that, um, you know, businesses, again, would be able to price however they need to in order to recoup costs and make a profit. But it's really the statement that I think this General Assembly would be saying is that, you know, it shouldn't be based on gender. Um, it should be based on the cost. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Your counterpart in the Senate, Senator Maroney, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Slapp, uh, for bringing this concept before us. I believe similar bills have been passed in other states, and I was just wondering if you could talk about what was the impact on small businesses in the other states uh, where this has passed. Yeah, thank you. And there's been robust discussion and debates about this. And as to your point, I mean, California, which is one of the largest economies in the world, passed this many years ago, and there's no evidence that it had any negative impact on, on businesses there. Uh, New York State just did. I mean, increasingly, you know, you're going to see more states do this. Miami-Dade County passed similar laws. So places with very large economies, with lots of small businesses, um, you know, we're able to do this. And um, so, so yeah, again, there's, there's no evidence um, that it's going to be, you know, bad for business. And, and I think, you know, discrimination, it's not, it, well, not only is it not fair, but it's also um, not good for the economy. And, you know, um, as I said, it's $1,500 a year on average is what it costs, you know, women uh, in their families. So um, I, I hear those, I don't want to hurt businesses either. And I think that, you know, um, I think CHRO's testimony will also be helpful to this committee to kind of learn about, you know, their, what their approach would be to this. So it's not a punitive approach. Thank you for the question. I hope that answers it. Thank you, Senator Sapp. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Chiefman, please. Thank you very much, Chair D'Agostino. Thank you for coming here today, Senator Slapp. And I know you and I discussed this bill uh, at an earlier time. Um, and again, with all due respect at the idea that this has been passed in California, New York, which are not known for their friendliness to business, if not necessarily reassuring. But I want to uh, refer to, I guess it was section four, subsection D, which talks about damages. And now, uh, so let's say I have a complaint. What do I do? Do I go to CHRO? What, what's the process? And uh, it, it refers to presiding officer shall file with the commission. So if you can just play out, if I am the complainant, what happens? Yep. And if I am the complainee, wh what happens to me? Right. Um, and 
and also, as I mentioned, CHRL, I believe, is on the list testifies. So, you know, obviously, um, you know, they can answer this question as well. But, um, yeah, I've had several meetings with CHRL and, you know, been discussing what the process might be. So if you had a complaint uh, as a consumer, you would go to CHRL, you would file the complaint with CHRO. They would uh, investigate that complaint. So essentially um, follow up uh, with the business in this case, you know, ask questions, et cetera. If, um, and this is something that's obviously the purview of this committee and how we want to um, go forward. If you do, and I hope you do with, with language, um, they would uh, be able to uh, uh, implement actually a fine that would uh, reimburse the consumer for uh, the difference in price. So it's a very light touch if you think about it. I mean, if it's a difference in this case between like a haircut or something, it was, you know, and $30 versus a $60 cut, right? You're talking about um, a $30 difference. Uh, you'd have to go through CHRO to file the complaint. It would not include punitive damages. And CHRO told me that they're also, they would really be focused on um, doing uh, education first and foremost, uh, warnings and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, it's obviously, you know, up to this committee to decide how you want to go forward with enforcement, but um, those are the conversations I have with CHRO. So we, it would, you know, we can flow through them. And I think of actually similar, similar legislation that, you know, I've worked on with um, Representative Rutigliano and, and others, um, you know, that the, the, I believe this is in 2019, um, when, you know, this, this body decided to um, prohibit the, uh, the salary history question. You know, and we work together to to make sure that it was not going to result in um, you know endless amounts of lawsuits for businesses. And I was pleased that we were able to work together and pass that you know bipartisan, overwhelming, and that's similar similar mechanism in terms of CHRO. Okay, so it's basically it's just the difference between the the rate charged one consumer as opposed to another based on gender. That uh, would be the fine. That, that's my idea, and I think CHRO is going to propose some other ideas for your consideration during their testimony. And through CHRO as opposed to Department of Consumer Protection? That's right. Okay. I, I, I look forward to hearing CHR testimony, and I thank you for bringing this to our attention. My concern with a lot of this, particularly with regard to the services industry, these are women who are supplying these services, and I would hate to do something that purported to be protecting women that actually had a disproportionate impact on them. But I look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Senator Sapp. Thank you, Chairman Daggett. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. I'm going gonna, gonna to hand off to Senator Maroney real quick and drop off and I'll be, I'll be back. Uh, but Senator, I don't think I see any further, Senator Maroney, I don't think I see any further questions. So I think we can probably move on to the next speaker. Thanks Senator Slap for his testimony. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Co-Chair. And Mr. Clerk, is uh, Representative Young? Yes, he is, he's on. Okay, great. Good morning, can you hear me? Good morning, yes. Please proceed, Representative Young. Excellent, thank you. Um, good morning, Chairman Maloney, or Chairman Maloney and D'Agostino, ranking members Whitcoast and Rotigliano, and members of the General Law Committee. Uh, I wanna thank the committee for this opportunity to testify on Senate Bill 187, uh, an act concerning cottage food operations. Uh, in 2019, this committee reported out legislation that concerned cottage food operations. This bill was passed, but in both chambers with bipartisan support and was signed into law. I felt then and still feel now that this was a great piece of legislation that would promote and encourage the cottage food industry here in Connecticut. Uh, as with many good pieces of legislation, after they are passed, we find and see issues and push for bills that make good legis legislation even better. SB uh, 187 does that by raising the cap of cottage food sales from 25 to 50 grand. Uh, this is a welcoming and smart change that I wholly endorse. I'm going to go a little bit different than what Jennifer did before. I think she gave a great um, uh, breakdown of some of the legal ramifications of this. I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, what the nuts and bolts are. Um, because I contend that the cap should be raised even higher to 1,000 or unlimited as other states in the United States do at this moment. 
Uh, as some of you know on the committee know, I came to the Connecticut General Assembly near th with nearly 30 years of experience in the food industry. I'm not an expert, but I have had the opportunity to run successful businesses and want to share that knowledge. When producing food for sale, the general rule of thumb is that your ingredient cost should be roughly a third of what your final retail cost. Uh, <laughs> um, Representative Ortigliano knows this very well. Um, that op obviously changes with the product you're producing, but that gives you an idea. So off the top of 50 grand, that's 16.5. Next up overhead, home-based, so probably a break in the rent, but it's still a cost associated to it. When you have utilities, maintenance, delivery costs, costs, packaging, storage, phone, um, and all the other minutiae and running the business. Add to that the original cost of the build out of the kitchen to bring it into compliance. And that's at least another third of 50 grand. So you're up to 33 grand now. Then there comes a big one, which is labor. Ideally, the home producer is making most of the product, but they still have to run the business. So you might need some help. That cuts into the last $17,000 um, without even taking taxes out. The margins on food industry are slim, but that's not as much money, and, but that's not much money to live on in Connecticut. Volume is how the food industry survives, so limiting sales to $50,000 is a daunting task in any way, shape, or form. Uh, with that in mind, I also suggest the addition of the mail sales uh, for non-perishable shelf-stable products, in addition to retail and delivery sales. This would give the cottage food operation a chance um, to really get better. Um, in summation, I look forward to make, making a great piece of legislation even better by promoting and in, incentivizing small businesses that are a huge part of Connecticut's future as well as its past. Thank you for your time and consideration. Um, I wanted to um, take any questions you might have um, because you know, we talked, we hit on some of these issues, but these things are actually watched over by the um, Commissioner of uh, Consumer Protection. The operators do have to take a completed food safety training program. Um, they can be, the kitchens can be inspected by um, somebody from the, the Consumer Protection Agency. So, and the license is given, but can also be taken away if they find that there's problems with it. Um, so I'm open to taking any questions you might have. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I see uh, Senator Whitcoast, uh, followed by Representative Tegliano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative, for coming and testifying this morning. Uh, as elected officials, we often get invites to a lot of different things. And I'm just curious, have you had an invite to go visit or tour a cottage food industry somewhere in your district or anywhere in the state? And what kind Absolutely. of industry was it? Um, I have, and actually one of the reasons why I got behind this bill was because I have somebody moving into Stratford who's going to testify in a while, and she has a business up in Massachusetts, a cookie business, and she wants to start that here in Connecticut. So, you know, obviously we talked about this issue and um, learned more about it um, and how she could potentially make a profit at doing it here in Stratford. Um, so, well... I have been to some, there was a place over in Milford I went to, it was called Poppy's Cheesecake. And I often use that in the restaurant I used to run. Um, great product. And it took me uh, to produce a local product, uh, do a good job. It kept me from having to make it, but then we could also promote that in the restaurant and sell it so at a profit. So it was a good, good, both for both of us. One of the things that uh, folks often have some concerns about is the cleanliness of the facility where they're making it and selling it for, for profit, if you will. And uh, ha having been in the restaurant uh, business, what was your what's your opinion of the facility that you went to go visit as far as um, the professionalism, the cleanliness, et cetera? Um, that was very good. Um, you know, there are, uh, they didn't have any problems there at all. You know, there are provisions within the law, current law, that say you can't have an animal in the area, that spaces need to be kept clean, um, and doo -doo -doo, uh, wastewater systems have to be actually checked to make sure that they are, are good. Um, so these are uh, some things that are there in place. Now, the Department of, uh, of um, Health obviously is a little stricter with these things, but um, we're talking about shelf-stable products that, um, you know, 
aren't going to be uh, contaminated very easily, put it that way. So these the ones I went to were very good. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wickos. Uh, Representative Vitigliano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, Representative. Good to see you. I took two quick questions. When you said you were Poppy's Cheesecake, um, is cheesecakes considered shelf stable? I mean, was that really a cottage food industry? With this, no, you're correct. Um, the cheesecake is not something that you can put on your shelf and sit there for a couple of months. No. All right. So, so but that would so be that a current cottage food law of cheesecake? No, but I was using that more as an example of somebody right. who is a small producer and how I would use it in the restaurant. But uh, you're correct. That is not a shelf-stable product and would not come under this law. Okay. And then number two, and maybe I should have asked the Department of Consumer Protection because I was reviewing all this stuff yesterday. If you're a cottage food provider, do you have to have a food handler? You have to go through the food handler class or the old qualified food operator? You know, that serve safe one that you and I always had to do? Which level do they have to do for uh, the cottage food industry? Do you know the answer to that one? As it stands right now, you have to go through the safe serve course, just like we did, and adhere to all those things that were taught in that class. Okay, because they're, they're the people I was talking to, I guess there was some question that there was the lower Q uh, food handler one as opposed to the QFO one, which now has a new name. I, I recognize that. but Well, it says right here um, in the law, that uh, each cottage food operation shall have attended and completed a food safety training program that includes training in food processing and packaging. A list of food safety training programs that are recognized by the commissioner shall be maintained in, on the Department of Consumer Protection's internet website. So there is, you know. Sounds like that's a regulatory issue, issue right? Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Vitigliano. Are there any further questions uh, for Representative Young? Okay. Uh, hearing none, uh, Representative Young, thanks for coming to testify before us and have a great day. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Mr. Clerk, uh, next, I believe, is uh, Tanya Hughes from CHRO. Yes, Tanya Hughes, and um, she wanted to partner with. Uh, Show Sharp to testify. Okay, uh, great. Please admit them, uh, Mr. Clerk. This should be a no. Okay. Should I begin? Good morning, Ms. Hughes. Yes, <laughs> please begin. Good morning, Senator Maroney, Representative Diagostino, Senator Wickhouse, Representative Rudaligiano, and members of the General Law Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony regarding Senate Bill 189, an act prohibiting sex or gender-based differential pricing for substantially similar goods or services. I'd uh, particularly like to thank Senator Derek Slapp for his attention to this very important issue. Um, I'm the Executive Director at the Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities, and with me this morning is our Deputy Director, Cheryl Sharp. And we support wholeheartedly the goal of eliminating unfair gender-based pricing. We firmly believe that this pink tax quote unquote, results in females of all ages paying more for substantially similar services and goods. We've seen the evidence of items with no appreciable difference aside from them being marketed for girls or women or for boys or men by color, and that they're frequently more expensive for the version for women or for feminine goods, ranging from ink pens to bikes or scooters or razors. My 80-year-old mother, in fact, complains almost daily about the differential in pricing for laundered goods. Um, dry cleaning service for a woman's button-down shirt is markedly more expensive than for a men's button-down shirt. And this bill aims to ensure that any price differential is due to products being or services being substantially dissimilar from one another and not due to the intended purchaser's gender. And I think there was a question earlier about what makes 
them different. And I think in the past, people have noted that maybe darts in a shirt will make it more difficult. And we don't want people not to get paid for additional services, but it needs to be gender neutral and not based on someone's gender. Um, it should be based specifically on the service that's being presented. Um, as our written testimony discusses in detail, we'd like to suggest that in order to be sure that this bill acts as a deterrent and with the aim of educating businesses that the language establishing a new discriminatory practice of gender-based pricing be removed in favor of perhaps a potential fine. Um, we haven't worked out the particulars on, on that, but we believe that by allowing the CHRO, and I think it's even been mentioned DCP, that can be worked out later, to levy a fine for gender-based pricing discrimination where circumstances warrant it. And that gives us the opportunity to focus on public education and working with businesses to ensure that they're complying with the law. Hopefully this will deter dis discriminatory pricing practices and encourage gender neutral pricing. Um, we'd be happy to provide language to the committee regarding these suggestions, and we thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of SB 189. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hughes. Are there any questions? Uh, Representative Cheeseman? Thank you very much, Chairman Maroney. Thank you for coming here today, Ms. Hughes. Uh, question, you mentioned uh, such things as bicycles, uh, razors. So let's say, for example, this passes. So is there a grounds for a complaint against Gillette because I pay more for my Venus replacement blades than you do for your other? I'm just sort of wondering, you know, where this stops, because exactly. do I go to my local small pharmacy and say, hey, these razors are more expensive? I, I, I'm just curious as to how this plays out in the real world, given the specific examples you gave us. Right. So we want to start first with educating the public and, and maybe working with the companies to demonstrate that a single blade razor that's only different based on the color should not be priced substantially differently. And I think civil rights is good for business. I think it, companies would should welcome that opportunity to make certain that the products that they're providing are not discriminating against anyone based on their gender. Um, and we're also willing to work with um, the committee to develop this further. So I suppose I'm just curious is does you know does this open the bar for a class action suit against Gillette because they're selling their uh, you know triple blades I, I, I so I, that's I not what we're because obviously we've, we've even recommended I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you no 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 I'm, I'm obviously I don't want to pay more than I have to because I'm a woman or see a man pay more than right. he has to because he's a man it, this should be if the if the service or good is exactly the same there should not be as you say you pay more because it's pink as opposed to green on the other hand it seems to be particularly given the examples you've you've given us that it's not simply a matter of me taking my blouse into my local dry cleaner and paying a bit more, that this is far more wide ranging. And I'm just curious as to you know, how, how limited you would like to see this being. Right, I think initially we would like to see people post gender uh, neutral pricing initially, and perhaps there be a fine for not adhering to that um, and, and that there perhaps be some incremental fines for not adhering. And after some additional uh, education and intervention, then, then we can entertain perhaps a complaint. But we do already see a substantial number of gender-based complaints within our agency. And so we're not trying to increase the number of complaints. We're trying to hopefully educate the public so that we can deter those complaints. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. I, I agree. No one wants to see discriminatory practices in any way, shape or form, but I'm very concerned by hearing repeated references to fines, by repeated references to punitive action. I think we've seen businesses struggling so much during the pandemic. You referenced dry cleaners. I mean, they've seen business dry up 
as it were, because people aren't going to the office. And I am always conscious as much as we want people to do the right thing, to do it in a positive way with education, as opposed to immediately looking for ways to punish them if they don't comply. My other concern, of course, is the education piece, because I suspect there are many businesses throughout Connecticut, despite us having passed the sexual harassment training law, who don't really know that they were supposed to do that. So we we are constantly making demands on our businesses, most of which are small and medium sized. And I am I am hesitant to do anything that's gonna make their lives even harder because after all, it's the people they employ, the revenue they break, bring in that pays for departments and organizations such as yours and us to be here. So I thank you. I'll listen with interest to the rest of the testimony. And I'm confident that we can come up with something that stresses education and refrains as far as possible from punishment. Thank you very much, Chairman D'Agostino. Can I respond? I fully concur. I have seen evidence of gender neutral pricing as I have um, patronized nail salons, right? Men and women patronize nail salons. It's one price to get a massage. It's one price to get your nails done. You get charged extra for callus removal and things like that. If it's additional services, you're, we, we don't have a problem with you charging for the additional service, but the pricing can be gender neutral. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Representative Cheesman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Hughes. Uh, Representative Vitigliano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is it still morning? Good morning, Miss. How are you today? I'm well, how are you? I appreciate you coming before us. I certainly wouldn't advocate for anybody being treated unfairly. I don't want any anybody to be uh, uh, charged more unreasonably. But I got to tell you, sometimes I get bogged down in the weeds on these things, and I start thinking about how things are actually going to work in the real world, and it makes me ask questions. Who it? Who is the enforcer of this policy? Who's going to go out and look at the business and say, "Okay, we're going to find you." Individual, um, this is Cheryl Sharp uh, from the commission, deputy director, but individual complainants come to our agency when they believe that they have been subjected to illegal discrimination. What we're doing here is saying that there is a lack of ed education and information regarding the uh, disproportionate impact of pricing on women. When we look at economics, we've tried to address the difference in uh, the salary uh, rates, right, for men and women, knowing that women are paid 80 cents to the dollar uh, as, as it relates to their um, employment. We're now uh, pivoting to another um, uh, area, which is goods and services, where women are being charged more, even though they're being paid less economically for the same work as a man, they're also being charged more for the same or similar goods and services because that's what we're comparing. And we talk, when we talk about the practical uh, nature of what's going on here and how it all plays out, it really boils down to from the time a, a, a little girl uh, wants to have a pink bicycle helmet, you're going to pay more, six or $7 more for that pink bicycle helmet than you'll pay for a blue one. Then as you become a teen and you, uh, the, Razors are marketed right to to girls and 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 to to young men, and then you're going to pay a couple dollars more for the the pink razor. And then when you go to get a simple haircut, we're not talking about someone who has really long hair who wants to get their hair cut because that wouldn't be the same or similar service to a boy who was going to get a short haircut. We're talking about the same type of haircut, the same simple haircut. And you're talking about young girls being charged more for a simple haircut than young boys are being charged. And then it, follow, it follows those individuals into their adulthood. And it's a whole a myriad of pro products, right? It's like, if you want a tool set in this pink, it's gonna cost more. So what CHRO and what Senator Slack was saying is that we have a mechanism in place and what we want to do primarily is to educate businesses, educate the public around this issue. And in educating them, if we have businesses who refuse to comply, because we have to look at the consumer as well as the small business because um, or medium-sized business, because in Connecticut, we have the consumers, right, that make up the various households who then go and patronize the businesses. But then we have this unfairness, this inequality, this discrimination that's happening. That's what we are looking to address. Well, I appreciate it. 
that you just re reviewed the bill. I get it, but it didn't really answer my question. My question was, if some business is doing the wrong thing, do they go to the Department of Consumer Protection? Do they go to law enforcement? Or do they have to file suit through CHRO to re, uh, address their grievance? How? And that, what is the mechanism of enforcement? <laughs> I, I get that you reviewed the reason we want the bill, but how how do you enforce the bill? Okay, so I'm sorry. I thought I was answering okay. that question, but here, here's a more direct answer. Um, and it is that uh, what is being proposed or what we are suggesting is that an individual complaining party would come to the CHRO and say that I paid, you know, $25 for this razor and then men paid 15 for theirs. Um, I want my $10 back. And right. so um, there could potentially, and this is where it needs to be graduated and we have to work out the language, but there could be a fine, but the fine would not be right then. It could first be an education that we go to that business and say that, there is a difference in pricing here. We educate them. We offer a training similar to the one that we offer for sexual harassment. We can go online and find out what the law is. Um, and so it will be the CHRO enforcing okay. um, in this area. Does the CHRO currently have the ability to find someone or is it really just do you guys file suit and then there's a remedy or a judgment against them? Do you, is there any other instance where you, you have the ability to sort of like write a ticket because they did something wrong? Um, we don't generally write tickets. We're 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 suggesting that this uh, step down approach be implored because of uh, the difficulty businesses have had, and because we think education in this area is so important. Generally, it would be someone is complaining of a discriminatory practice. But what we're saying is, let's not make this a discriminatory practice. Let's educate and let's give a fine because it is less strict and it does not involve the process of a discriminatory practices. Completely. We want to work with the businesses to cure the, the problem. I, I totally get it. I totally get what you're saying. I understand. But I, when I hear the word fine, this is what pops into my head. What happens if we don't pay the fine? So if I get a speeding ticket and I don't pay, I don't pay my speeding ticket, which is essentially a fine. It's a violation. It's a fine. If, if I don't pay it, and then I don't appear, I go to jail. I, I could be arrested for not taking care mm -hmm. of what I'm supposed to take care of. So if CHRO files a lawsuit and I lose, that's a judgment and I pay. But if CHRO fines me and then somebody doesn't pay the fine, well, then what happens? Mm -hmm. is, is that business person going to be subject to arrest for not paying their violation? No, they would not be subject to arrest. But what could be written into the statute is that we could take an enforcement action against them where they would have to pay the fine. It would be forcing them to pay the the, the uh, fine. Um, well, and it would be would a graduated fine. What would that action look like? What, what would that look like? Going to a court and saying that there was this fine and they didn't pay the fine. And so we want them to be compelled to pay the fine. And the fine was whatever it's set in statute, $50, $100. And then, then getting that. Um, because look, we're as an agency of the state, we're looking to use as few resources as possible to accomplish this education that we want to provide to businesses as well. And we're happy to work with the committee um, to work out these details. Thank you, madam. I want to conclude my questions. i I'm certainly, I understand, I really was really talking about the mechanism more than the issue itself. So uh, I will continue to listen. I appreciate you answering my questions. And uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Tagliano. Are there any, uh, does anyone else have a, a question? If not, I actually have a question. I, I mean, you already receive uh, gender-based complaints at CHRO. So do you, in some ways, do you already have the ability to respond if someone were to complain that the, they were, their service was priced differently because of their gender? Would that be considered a discriminatory practice that you could act upon? We have the our public accommodation law, but generally someone wouldn't uh, bring a complaint and say that they were charged, you know, ten or fifteen dollars more because the discriminatory complaint process requires a complaint to be filed, it to be served, for an investigation to be conducted. It's you know a more protracted process. That's why, as opposed to making this a discriminatory practice, we want to just make it so that it is an educational opportunity for us to address so that we don't get uh, um, onslaught of complaints, you know, 
related to difference in treatment in places of public accommodation based on based on pricing. Pricing, I'm sorry. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. Right. Does uh, anyone else have uh, further questions? Okay, hearing none. Uh, Ms. Hughes, Ms. Sharp, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Clerk. Uh, up next is uh, Betsy Garth. Great. Is uh, Ms. Gara in? Yes, good afternoon. I'm here. <laughs> good afternoon. Please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Senator Maroney, Representative D'Agostino, Senator Whitkos, and Representative Rutigliano. My name is Betsy Gara. I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Council of Small Towns, which represents approximately 118 towns throughout Connecticut. We're here to support Senate Bill 190, an act concerning municipal assessment and finance personnel. And I want to particularly thank Senator Whitkos for bringing this issue forward. Uh, there were a number of uh, municipalities, uh, particularly in the Northwest section of the state uh, and other sections of the state that are having a real difficulty trying to hire assessors and other key personnel, including finance directors. And with respect to the assessors, we did look into this and it, it appears that it, part of the difficulty is due in large part because the certification programs that are required in order to become an assessor are not readily available to individuals throughout Connecticut. So my understanding is that the courses are currently offered at the assessor school that is held the first week uh, in June at the UConn stores. And that according to the CCMA guidebook, the courses are sometimes made available in other locations throughout the fall. Um, and each course consists of at least 30 hours of instruction, including examination. In order to get the certification as a Connecticut Municipal Assessor designation one, you need to complete five 30-hour training courses. And, you know, again, given that the, they were primarily located in stores, it was difficult. Certainly this was exacerbated during the pandemic when UConn was not able to offer in-person classes but it's become a real issue. And, and part of this is due because we're seeing this in a lot of different entities and organizations that there is that silver tsunami where you have a significant number of people retiring, but we just don't have people ready to take, um, uh, to, to be um, certified in place. And so we have about 20 or so towns that I know that um, have posted looking for either assessors or assistant assessors, and they just can't find them. And we have had certain instances where people have expressed interest in serving as an assessor, but they find it just difficult to get the training that they need to obtain the certification. So we do believe that this bill will help address that, this by ensuring that OPM looks at whether or not the training is provided in ways that are readily available to individuals throughout the state and that they provide more online training. They did end up, I did talk to Jennifer Gauthier from the Office of Policy and Management, and she sits on the committee that oversees assessor certification. And she did say that they made online courses available during the pandemic and that this was very helpful uh, and that they would be interested in making sure that those are offered again. But I think sometimes it does take some legislation to encourage those conversations to occur and to make sure that the issues are addressed because obviously assessors are critical to the municipal government operations and we wanna make sure that we have uh, excuse people- Excuse me, Ms. Gara, just a heads up, you have a three minute marker, if you start wrapping up, please. I am wrapped up. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. I do see we have a few questions. Uh, Senator Whitkos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Betsy, for coming up and testifying uh, today. I know it certainly is a, a problem across the state, not only up in the northwest corner, but uh, all four corners of the state where we're trying to find those municipal employees. And the towns have even gotten to the point where they're trying to share those positions with other municipalities. Um, but it, it's extremely difficult. And I think, as you said, this will go a long way. But my question is, and I'm glad we're be able to partner with cost and CCM uh, to get those job postings out there. Cause we want, uh, you know, people that to know about the job openings available to them. And we certainly want to make sure that the, the certification process is available to them to get these, these great jobs. Uh, what, 
could you speak to the fact of what the towns have done to and how long they've been looking for for some of these positions? Well, I've heard from some towns. So, for example, Bob Bessel, the first selectman of Canton, indicated in his written testimony that they've been trying to fill the position since last June. So that's a significant amount of time to go without an assessor, given their role in valuing properties for purposes of property taxation. I don't have information on the others. There is a list of towns that are posting availability for assessors on the Connecticut Association of Assessing Officers website. Um, and so uh, it, it was about uh, 20 or 23 different towns that are looking for these positions. And could you just, just for the uh, educational aspect of the members of the community who may not be familiar with what an assessor does, what, what, what does an assessor do for a community? Well, an assessor goes out and uh, assesses the value of all property in the community for purposes of determining equitable distribution of property taxes. So includes homes, uh, cars, well, cars, a little different, personal property, businesses, and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I'm just uh, taking over for Senator Maroney and looking for other comments. I see Senator Kissel. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Betsy, great to see you. I guess it just turned afternoon. Uh, I won't say his name, uh, although I just gave away his gender uh, or the community that he serves. But since we're talking about assessors, uh, I, have a, I have a community in my district where it appears that a new assessor or newly hired uh, in the last uh, eight months or so, just flip tons of previously exempt properties, causing a lot of problems in the town and a lot of appeals and a lot of people going to their elected leaders. And, uh, and you know, I sort of don't know. Uh, I don't wanna cast aspersions, but you know, I don't know if there's pressure to try to get as much revenue for a municipality, or is this a question of training? Uh, and I'm just wondering if this is something common throughout the state of Connecticut, or it's just a, an aberration up in the north central part of the state. And I'm just wondering, since you know you are with the organization that covers all these towns, uh, have you heard about anything like that? I haven't heard of that. I'm, and I'm just so I understand your question, you're indicating that they significantly increase the assessment for various properties in your community or? Yeah, yeah, farmland, uh, previously exempt charitable organizations, uh, VFW, stuff like that, just like a whole slew across the board, not really residential, not really you know major businesses, but all these other sort of ancillary, really good citizens throughout the town just causing a lot of hubbub and i'm just wondering like did this person get orders try to get as much revenue as possible but or was it just misinterpreting the way the rules are or just not you know a lack of training i i don't know my understanding is that with respect to certain properties like group homes there's been a significant um debate as to what group homes are um, eligible for tax exemption and which ones are not. And there's actually been litigation to that effect. And so there is a bill before, actually two bills before the Planning and Development Committee this year that would address that. There's also been some changes to uh, the property tax exemption laws. There was one with respect to um, farmland recently that I'd have to look into. But, you know, there, there does arise that there are some questions as to how to administer the current exemptions. And um, there oftentimes a new assessor will come on and think and see that properties that probably should have been subject to property taxes have been for whatever reason considered exempt. And maybe they're looking at new interpretations of the law or new um, or changes to the law to do that. But there does seem to be a significant amount of training. Um, you know, as I mentioned, to obtain certification as a assessor one, it's five courses, 30 hours 
each course, you have to also demonstrate a certain level of experience in assessment, as well as completing an examination. So it does seem that the training requirements are robust. Um, so I'd have to look into the particulars of your situation to find out more about that. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate that. Again, I, I don't want to cast any malignment against the individual. Uh, May just came in and said, oh, this town's been doing it wrong all along and I'm going to straighten it out. And then all of a sudden, a lot of people got a shock in the mail. And, you know, rather than going through the formalized, you know, appellate process through Board of Assessment Appeals, I guess it is. And again, this is sort of like a I'm not going to say a backwater, but unless you bump into this, and like I said, this community, all of a sudden, this this hit the radar. Uh, but I appreciate the fact that planning and development has a couple of bills, uh, and if we can step in, I think, you know, good, bad, or indifferent. I think that uh, certitude, certitude is is important, and so if we need to clarify something, so it's not a gray area. Uh, that makes everybody happier because I think if it's sort of like up in the air and, you know, assessor A interprets it this way and assessor B interprets it that way, maybe we as a legislature have to clear the waters a little bit so that people can understand what's coming down the road. But I appreciate that. Maybe it's an aberration, but uh, I'll, I'll check out those PND uh, bills as well. Uh, but I just want to alert you too. I mean, this is this is a real deal. And, uh, you know, things that would make my eyes roll, like, really, they're not a charitable organization, that's all they do. And so I just wonder what's going on out there. Uh, that's all, just thought I'd, since we're talking about assessors, we never really do that. So I figured I'd uh, flag down the train while you were here. So thanks, and thanks for all you do for our communities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Sam. Up next is uh, Jessica Blinsky. There's Jessica. Hi. 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 <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, Chairs Maroney and Degastano and Senator Wickhouse, Representative Reticliano, and all the members of the committee. Thank you so much for your time and for considering this Cottage Food Bill 187. The changes to the existing law would be an enormous blessing for many home businesses and their families. And I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to testify in front of all of you. I'm a Connecticut native. I was born and raised in Trumbull and all of my family and support system still reside there. And I desire to be back with them serving in the community. Um, it's been 11 years since moving out of state and I still call Connecticut home, but the cottage food law there prevents me from being able to move back. I currently live in Massachusetts and I run my cottage food business serving a very niche clientele making decorated sugar cookies. And Massachusetts has no sales cap whatsoever. So I'm able to operate my business without having to limit my sales. And I know that you already know this, but Connecticut is one of the of only a handful of states with a sales cap with 31 states allowing cottage food bakers to operate without any income restrictions. And only seven other states have a sales cap that is 25,000 or lower with 11 other states having sales caps between 35 and 250,000. So further, no other neighboring states limit how much revenue cottage food producers can make, including all of New England and New York. And I can testify on behalf of other home bakers who have had to make the choice to move to parts of Rhode Island and Massachusetts, which border Connecticut, in order to have easy access to the state, but still be able to run their business without restrictive stipulations. So in other words, people want to live in Connecticut, myself included, um, but we're having to make the decision to operate outside of state lines in order to support our households and pursue our passions simply due to the limitations of the cottage food law. So um, home-based businesses, they check so many boxes specifically for women, given that many home bakers are females, these limitations are particularly stifling for women who desire to work from home and still be able to raise young families. Um, the rising cost of daycare, the impact of COVID, these are just two areas of concern that would be remediated by being able to work from home. So the flexibility that it provides, it builds happier, more satisfied and less stress tax 
paying, a less stress tax paying population. Um, additionally, there are cottage food producers who aspire to purchase commercial storefront spaces and the option to work from home in the meanwhile without income restrictions allows small businesses to accomplish greater goals. Um, and I can speak from experience that, that in other states like Massachusetts, um, I know that this came up, the home inspections, they are performed here, um, but they're done so through private contractors. So contractors come into the home, conduct thorough inspections with costs being incorporated into our own licensing fees, which are about $100 per year. Um, so uh, the bottom line for me is that I do want to be in Connecticut. My heart is there. I want to run a business in Connecticut where residents there can benefit from it. I want to raise a family there. I want to be a part of the community growing as a small business in my home state. But the limitations of this food law prevent me from doing that. And moving the cap from twenty five dollars to 50000 is definitely a great step. And I'm very grateful um, for any efforts to push, to push ahead um, with these changes, but it would be better and best if we were to take things a step further so people in this field can make a realistic living. So we urge the committee to edit the bill to remove the cap altogether so the cottage food producers can reach their full potential. And especially with the times that we're living in. Um, um, just a heads up, you have three minute markers. You can start wrapping up, please. Last sentence, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yes, with rising inflation costs and just everything that we're going through in this economy, it's more important than ever that all people can make an honest living doing what they love without the income restrictions. So again, I thank you so much for your time and for your consideration. Oh, what do you make? I make decorated sugar, custom decorated sugar cookies. <laughs> all right. Yeah, not the, I was just going to say I'm not going to suggest any bribery, but you know. Well, I would more. I'd be more than happy to bring you some cookies. <laughs> more than happy. Questions are coming. It, it could be research. I think if it's under yeah, ten dollars, research, research, okay. thank you, Senator. <laughs> Representative Tigliano. Thank you, uh, and go Trumbull. Uh, Jessica, nice to see you. Uh, I enjoyed me talking with your father, and uh, I may or may not have a sample there. <laughs> what you got going on? But let's take this. I, if you had to have a limit, what do you think? Let's say we're not going to do the unlimited. We're going to take the cap off entirely. What do you think is a reasonable limit for a business of your size that comes out of your house? Honestly, I think if we're going to put a limit on it, I think anything less than 100000 would be stifling. And uh, of the cookies that you make, the business that you have, how much of that is through the mail and how much of that is you uh, either you know, delivering to people or you know, farmer's markets or other opportunities that you have to sell? Currently, I'm only doing um, pickups. So people must pick up at the location. Um, I know that there are a lot of cottage food producers out there, though, who do ship. And I know a lot of Connecticut cottage food producers who are very much so um, hoping to be able to ship because I know that that's a big, I will say, I, I would say probably about 50% of the inquiries I get are for people who are looking for me to ship. I just, I just don't ship. Just Is there any that. restrictions from you shipping to a different state? Or like, so say, say you put your business in Connecticut and mm -hmm. we, Right now, you can't mail to somebody else in Connecticut. They got to pick up. But is there any rule or law that says, hey, I can't mail this to somebody in New York? Yeah, actually, Massachusetts does not allow you to, to cross state lines with shipping. There are states that do allow it, but Massachusetts is not one of them. Okay. Oh, thank you for the information. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony, Jessica. Thank you. Sam? Up next is uh, Sean Jeffrey. Good afternoon, Senator Maroney, Representative D'Agostino, Senator Wickos, Representative Rutigliano, and members of the General Law Committee. I'm Dr. Sean Jeffrey, Director of Pharmacy at Hartford HealthCare's Integrated Care Partners, and also a Professor of Pharmacy Practice at the University of Connecticut. And today I'm here to support SB 186. I'm joined in that work by a coalition of our profession, and we've worked very closely with the agency to bring this language to you today. I'm a pharmacist and my responsibilities at Hartford HealthCare include improving the medication use across our outpatient medical practices. 
This includes all of Hartford Healthcare Medical Group, which consists of 230 primary care practices and 500 specialists. And we care for about 250,000 patients across Connecticut. And I can assure you that those practices are very, very busy. And at Harvard Healthcare, we're always looking for ways that we can improve the way we deliver care. One of the things that we've identified as an improvement is how we handle medication refills. Currently, our system handles approximately 1 million outpatient refills annually. That, those refills are generated when a pharmacist calls or a patient calls or a fax is received or there's an in-basket message that's received. And it requires an awful lot of work among our staff. And we believe that we can make this better by centralizing that process to a team of dedicated pharmacists. And by doing that, those dedicated pharmacists would help improve the accuracy, timeliness, and satisfaction of our patients, clinician, and office staff. But in order to do that, we have to delegate that responsibility from the prescriber to the pharmacist to handle that refill. And that requires a collaborative drug therapy agreement. Now, unfortunately, Connecticut's current collaborative drug therapy agreements require a pharmacist to enter the agreement with a prescriber and a patient, and you need one for each of those settings. So what we're hoping to do is propose that we expand that and allow pharmacists to collaborate with multiple prescribers across a population of patients as defined within their scope of practice. It's just not feasible to have each and every patient and provider sign these. So it's time to modernize these agreements and catch up with other states that have been doing this. I'm also a trustee for the American Pharmacists Association and running for president-elect. And I know that nationally, the trend is for states to liberalize their collaborative agreements to allow these multiple uh, provider practice and uh, population-based agreements to exist. And presently, there's 26 states that currently allow that. And the states that have incorporated these changes and liberalized their agreements within the outpatient care team increase patient access to providers, decrease healthcare costs, and improve medication outcomes. And finally, as a professor of pharmacy at UConn, I've helped educate a generation of pharmacists. And our pharmacists are highly trained and increasingly specialized. And increasingly, they're seeking practice opportunities in more progressive locations outside of Connecticut. So by changing this statute, we'll help to energize Connecticut's pharmacy practice, help to retain some of our local talent, and I believe we're going to improve the care and quality of patients across Connecticut. Finally, I just want to put a plug in for HB 5223 and say that I am wholeheartedly in support of including pharmacists in patient assistant programs. This is a, a subject that's very dear to my heart, very close to my family, and I strongly urge that this be passed to allow pharmacists to be incorporated into those assistant programs. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Questions? I saw a hand there. Uh, Representative Cheeseman, please. Of course, Chair D'Agostino. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming here today to testify. We heard when Department of Consumer Protection um, presented their testimony, they felt a lot of work was still needed on this bill, that it was very much uh, in, still in progress. Uh, if, would you like to comment on that? And also their concern that they would need additional staff to, to uh, monitor this and uh, keep oversight. So I'd just like you to weigh in on that, if you could, please. Certainly. Thank you, Representative Cheeseman. Um, as I stated, this uh, bill actually is coming before you with quite a steam of, uh, or had a steam behind it. We've been circling all of the professional pharmacy associations together to make sure they're behind the language, and they all are. They're all very supportive of this. We have had uh, outreach with the Connecticut Hospital Association, and tomorrow I'll be meeting with the Connecticut State Medical Society on this as well. Um, I believe that you'll find that this is far more cohesive in, in agreement among the profession and among our practitioners that this impacts than uh, what perhaps the commission might have uh, indicated. Regarding the additional workload that might be incurred by the um, Department of Drug Control or the Drug Control Division, uh, what we're proposing in this language is to allow the institutions to help set these priorities and to work internally. And I think you're going to hear testimony from some of my colleagues about how this would work. But if, if this is being uh, put forward within the institutions, let's say Hartford or Yale are, are de designing this agreement so that it meets their needs, 
uh, I think you're going to find that there's going to be less chances of their uh, pharmacist running a foul or doing anything that's outside of what the protocol exists. So where I think the work could exist for the uh, Department of uh, Drug Control is around specifically just approving the number of potential collaborative agreements that might come forward because we're going to be unleashing a workforce that hasn't been fully recognized. And once the providers start to be able to incorporate pharmacists in this new model, I think what you're going to find is that they're going to be very excited about thinking of other opportunities that heretofore they haven't considered before. So there could be some work that Director Marriott has to handle in terms of uh, reviewing some of these protocols. But on the enforcement side, I'm, I'm doubtful that there's going to be a lot of additional enforcement that needs to occur. Okay, thank you. And I apologize if this was presented in earlier testimony. Are there other states where this is currently going on? Are we, uh, are we modeling this on successful practices elsewhere? We are. And actually, I'd be happy to share with you the rundown of all the legislation of all 50 states. But there are 26 other states that have agreements that allow multiple uh, um, a pharmacist to work in a multi-modal uh, platform where they are working with uh, a group of physicians around a group of patients that is specific to either a group of a disease. Let's say they're going to manage the diabetics for a particular practice. So Connecticut is really playing a bit of catch up here. We had some of the earliest collaborative drug therapy agreements in the country when we first enacted them, but we just haven't kept pace with where the profession is going and largely the changes in healthcare around electronic medical records, telehealth, different advances that we have to deliver the care more efficiently. Well, given how integral uh, drug treatments are in handling chronic diseases, you mentioned diabetes, but there's so many heart disease, all of those things, I would have thought having this sort of collabor collaborative setup would not only help the practitioners, but ideally keep our residents healthier. So thank you very much. I'd be interested if you know, share offline, perhaps with the clerk, some of that other legislation from other states to have a look at. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you, Chair D'Agostino. Thank you. Can our um... Legal research folks collect that and get that to Representative Cheeseman. We're working with Sam. Absolutely. Thanks. Great. Uh, other questions or comments? All right. Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Sam. Up next is Nathan Tinker. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for. Uh, yeah. Good to see you again so soon. <laughs> um, uh, I just wanted to say you already have my uh, our testimony regarding SB uh, 186 and uh, HB 5223. Um, I just wanted to highlight on SB uh, 186 that you know, as Sean just said, this is a a uh, a bill that would put us and, and Connecticut forward as a uh, a state in the in in healthcare and we are as as we've already mentioned kind of playing catch up in, in many ways on the idea of collaborative practice and this is a great opportunity to take advantage of that it also i want to highlight the connection between this bill and um some regulation that was just approved on february 18th regarding shared pharmacy services now shared pharmacy services allows pharmacists and pharmacies to work together to uh, uh serve patients in a way that they have not been able to to this uh, um, point. SB 196 would actually allow that regulation and the pharmacists and, and uh, uh, doctors working within it to bring for, to, to really work at the top of that pr practice, at the top of their license, and to take full advantage of the regulatory schema that uh, the, ph the pharmacy services piece uh, uh, offers. Um, it's also a bill about patients. Uh, it, it'll uh, increase the access of patients to, to treatment. It'll help to lower costs by lowering uh, the redundancy and paperwork and things like this. And also help pharmacists and, and physicians uh, to address burnout by reducing those administrative burdens and so forth that, that already ex exist in the system now. So it actually has, a, has implications across the, the healthcare spectrum in, in, uh, in a lot of ways. Um, just briefly uh, on H. HB 5223, um, uh, allowing pharmacists to take uh, advantage of the, um, the HAVEN program is an extremely important opportunity. And I, I, I want to specifically thank uh, Representative Tigliano for bringing this forward as, they, uh, uh, as a concept. Um, 
we fully uh, support the concept and how uh, it would work out. We think it addresses a lot of the issues that um, pharmacists have, have not been able to address um, because they have not been a part of this program. Um, but I think that there is, as, as we've already discussed a little bit uh, from earlier speakers, some details that still need to be hammered out in terms of, of where that will be housed. I know DCP has some interest in it, DPH, uh, et cetera, um, as well as how the funding mechanisms will work around that. That said, um, it is a way to uh, allow pharmacists to um, um, rehabilitate their licenses in a way that they have not been able to uh, thus far. And uh, I think it's very important to uh, uh, address that from a uh, health, safety, and patient access uh, point of view. Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, and <clears throat> Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Sam. Up next, we have Dr. Cynthia Heller. Hi, can you hear me okay? All set, Dr. Heller, thank you. Okay, good. Good morning. Hi, my name is Cynthia Heller. I'm a, a, a primary care physician in Connecticut since 1990, practicing in South Windsor and East Hartford, as well as the physician in chief of Hartford Healthcare Medical Group. Um, I think Sean already spoke to the size of our organization and the reason that we're speaking in behalf of this bill, but I thank you for the opportunity to allow me to speak as well. Um, my driving goal has always been to look for ways to improve our performance and reduce costs. I also spend a lot of time worrying about um, burnout and fatigue among our providers. We, we are starting to see some early retirements and people reducing from full-time to part-time, um, you know, looking for ways so that the doctors of Connecticut can spend their time with their patients rather than on administrative tasks would help alleviate some of this burden and would continue to support our patients. Uh, one barrier to achieving these goals is the uh, inability to utilize our pharmacists effectively, as Sean had mentioned, due to the one-to-one -one relationship in the current statutes. Uh, in other states, pharmacists are integrated more within primary care practices, providing medication management uh, services that reduce the doctor's burden and help actually save money. Pharmacists can usually find a less expensive way and a more streamlined way to manage medication. Um, particularly when there are multiple prescribers for one patient, resulting in lower costs and better compliance. Um, a pharmacist can always take a complicated pill regimen and simplify it by looking at it holistically. I would like to have pharmacists manage medication refills through a centralized refill hub, which is available through our electronic health record. Pharmacists overseeing our medications would increase the accuracy, the timeliness and patient satisfaction, and certainly reduce burnout among our doctors and staff. Some offices handle as many as 100 medication refills a day, and we have almost a million medication refills per year. This takes time away from our patients, and I do believe pharmacists would do this better. In order to create this new opportunity to improve care and save money, pharmacists must have a collaborative drug therapy management agreement with the prescriber which would allow the prescriber to delegate responsibilities to the pharmacist and also stipulates how the pharmacist needs to report it back to the prescriber. The current statute is cumbersome so that we have not really been able to move forward and utilize it. We took a fresh look at the reg legislation and came up with ways to modernize this language and allow institutions to set up collaborative drug therapy agreements giving our Connecticut pharmacists the ability to practice at the top of their license. It doesn't allow the pharmacist to diagnose, that would still be the doctor, um, and it doesn't expand their scope of practice, but it will allow them to fine tune medication regimens with the physicians to save patients money and also um, to alleviate some of the administrative burden. So we would have that more streamlined and less expensive care for everyone. You know, as I said, I practiced here for 20 years. And if we pass this bill, I really look forward to our pharmacy team being integrated and practicing alongside us and helping us provide better care 
Um, thank you for your consideration. I'm actually very excited about this. Sean knows that I've been talking about working closer with pharmacists since I moved into my leadership role in 2015. So this would be a huge step forward. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, doctor. Very comprehensive. And due to that comprehensive nature, I don't see any questions for you, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Sam. Up next is Bonnie Stewart. She does not seem to be responsive, so we're going to just move on to Stephanie McGuire. Thank you, Sam. Wait, um, for him. No, nope. she's here. Yep, I'm Ms. McGuire. Good afternoon, Senator Maroney, Representative DiAgostino, and honorable members of the General Law Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in support, Kimberly Sander. In support of HB number 523, an act expanding the professional assistance program for regulated professions to include pharmacists, if indeed appropriate funding sources are able to be provided. My name is Stephanie McGuire. I'm the co-chairperson of the Connecticut Nurses Association Government Relations Committee. And I'm Connecticut Children's Nurse, Rep or not Connecticut Children's, Connecticut Nurses Association's nurse representative on the Haven Board and a Granby resident. Now more than ever, ensuring a healthy professional workforce is a priority, including for the pharmacists. There's evidence that increasing numbers of healthcare professionals who seek to serve are not now finding themselves needing to seek services. We encourage you to support these professionals, including pharmacists, and to increase funding for the Health Assistance Intervention Education Network, also known as HAVEN, the organization committed solely to meeting their needs. As an experienced APRN, I have witnessed both personally and professionally the devastating impact on professional careers that physical and mental illness, chemical dependence, and emotional disorders can have on once trusted loved ones and colleagues. The effect reaches all aspects of an individual's daily activities, but our professional commitment continues to be to ensure the safety of the public that we interact with daily. Unfortunately, pharmacists, despite their undeniable core role in the healthcare delivery team, were not included in the original design of the Haven program, but because of their licensing structure through the Department of Consumer Protection. And it's clear now, however, that pharmacists too are at similar risk for the need of the services that Haven provides. I've had the firsthand experience to witness the magnitude of the work that Haven does but also the financial challenges that Haven faces. The support provided by the addition of our $5 per professional license in 2016 was crucial to establish and um, stabilize the Haven budget. The addition of a fee to the pharmacist license would appear at least in part an equitable part of that new solution. At heart, the Connecticut Nurses Association respectfully encourages other potential funding strategies to be explored as well, including state funding to match the fees that the individual licenses provide. The Connecticut Nurses Association agrees that the pharmacist community should also be eligible for Haven services as valued healthcare professional partners. And we recognize the importance of financial support that makes Haven fiscally competent for the future. And we thank you for seeking these answers. Thank you, Ms. McGuire. Senator Kissel, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. McGuire, thank you for your testimony. I actually met a nurse that was going through uh, substance abuse uh, recovery uh, and was interacting with uh, or Haven was sort of the umbrella organization that they were working through. Uh, they didn't want to lose their career. Uh, and there were some 
difficult requirements to oversee that individual, obviously uh, being a nurse uh, in a position where he or she uh, was dealing intimately with patients' lives. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the things he or she said was that they were subject to random uh, drug and alcohol testing and that that was really expensive. And I, I had no idea, uh, but that that was a tremendous burden. So uh, a lot of resources have to get poured in each and every one of these cases, I'm thinking. So you want pharmacists to come under this umbrella. I, I mean, what kind of, I mean, what kind of dollar value would they, what's the cost ramifications for the pharmacists themselves and the organization as a whole? I think that organization as a whole doesn't necessarily face additional just per person, per person requiring care. That's the real implication for the pharmacist coming on board. I think at this point, it needs to be recognized that Haven really is a valued and esteemed organization throughout the country in terms of the degree of service that they provide to these healthcare professionals. I think that having been said, to have them um, accessible, to have that service accessible to them is only really, talk about an equitable situation. As a part of the team, they deserve the best of the services as well. So when it comes to the dollars and cents of it, it's going to be the numbers of persons who come into service care um, under Haven, not necessarily the fact that they are a pharmacist. Okay, uh, very particular, I won't name her name, but my sister-in-law is a pharmacist and is she gonna be deducted out of her pay if they come under this or how does that all work? So that's at present, the $5 fee is an additional licensing fee attached to our professional licenses. That obviously, um, like I said, it has helped tremendously, but it doesn't fix the problem. And especially now that in general, the numbers of persons seeking service has dramatically increased and we're continuing to see that increase. So in terms of supply and demand, the demand is definitely um, just accelerated. So for your sister-in-law, the services that Haven provides wouldn't be any different pricing structure necessarily than for the other professionals. Okay. So pay, it's just her, the typical fees. And is Haven just Connecticut? You said national. So each, uh, each state has their own uh, program for their professionals. Uh, Haven is really relatively <laughs> unique in the sense that it combines a variety of professionals under one um, care agency, Haven. Yeah. Okay. And a nursing association may care for their um, nurses within their profession and each discipline has their own program. Sure. And and I appreciate that. And I, and I would just, I appreciate where this legislation is going. And I think there's a need for a couple of reasons. Uh, Just, you know, every single caucus has brought forward proposals regarding mental health, Uh, I think there's spillover into substance abuse and things like that. Uh, Just the pressures to bear, whether, uh, especially in the healthcare area and in every part of it. And and also, uh, I think with the baby boomers getting older, I mean, it's hard to watch regular network programming in the evening. I discover more illnesses and more treatments just by watching the commercials. And I go, you know, when I was a kid growing up watching TV, I never saw all this stuff. It was all like, you know, the toy, uh, (laughs) the tidy bowl guy or something else like that. And now it's like, you know, I can't go to bed at night without saying, you know, I'm glad I don't have that affliction or this. And that just means more demands on our pharmacists. And also the pandemic uh, has ratcheted up people's uh, anxiety levels. I can't walk into a CVS to get a bag of peanuts without seeing a long line at the pharmacy counter for people getting booster shots and things like that. So, and I just happened to go into another convenience store uh, pharmacy and I was friends with the woman that works at the counter. And she said, we just lost our pharmacist because 
you know, a guy was told that his medication was going to be ready at on a Tuesday and it wasn't. And the pharmacist just said, please be patient. I'll have it for you in a few hours. And the guy just refused to leave the store, just launched on that poor pharmacist. And the guy just said, I quit, you know, and it's like, yeah, that's not an early, uh, that's not going from full-time to part-time, but I just think, you know, all of these things are coming together at the same time. And so I think the need is there and it's great driving around town and seeing hearts on trees saying, thank you. Uh, but when we're talking about people on the front lines, I think pharmacists are there just with everyone else. And it's hugely stressful. Uh, we all remember that movie, It's a Wonderful Life, when, the, when he was working for the pharmacist and he you know, gave the wrong medication and it could have killed the guy. I mean, yeah, you, you, it's an area where uh, human frailty is not forgiven easily at all. And uh, so you have to be like totally 100% all the time. And that's our expectation as a society and justifiably so, but really hard job. And it's just, you know, it's, it's unceasing. So thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate, I appreciate that. I also would say that um, you used a great word in terms of umbrella. And really the role that the pharmacist has had forever and continues to have for the future hasn't really changed. It's just a matter of bringing them into the same kind of service arm. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank you. no further questions for you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. McGuire. Sam? Okay, um, so Bonnie Stewart is on, so she can testify next. Great. Thank you, Ms. Stewart. Hello. Hi, good afternoon. I apologize about the snafu uh, uh, before. Sorry, thank you. Um, Chairs Malone, Maroney, Giagostino, Senator Wickos, Representative Tigliano, and the other distinguished members of the General Law Committee. I thank you for the opportunity to present today on House Bill 5222. My name is Bonnie Stewart, and I'm the CEO of the Connecticut Society of CPAs. The CTCPA is Connecticut's leading professional CPA organization, and we have almost 6,000 members throughout the state. We're here today to request language be added to House Bill 5222 to allow charitable nonprofits with gross revenues between 500,000 and a million to choose to have either a CPA audit report or a CPA review report. Presently, audits are mandated and reviews are not an option. However, audits are uh, more expensive than reviews are and reviews would save charities money while continuing to offer a sufficient level of review. Permitting the uh, reviews would allow more money to support programs and the charity's mission. It would reduce some of the burdens and workload on the charitable staff, which are often very few. And this cuts costs as well for those smaller nonprofits, again, allowing for more funds to be allocated to their objectives and purpose. I appreciate the fact that you're taking this under consideration and we urge the adoption of this new language. Um, Happy to answer any questions anyone may have and would just like to point out that I do, um, I'm fortunate enough to have one of our members, a CPA speaking shortly who could answer some specific questions regarding um, audits versus reviews if you have any. If we do at the moment, Representative Cheeseman. Thank you, thank you very much for coming here today, Bonnie. Can you tell how many uh, charities, 501c3s this change would affect? I don't have um, recent data, but I do know that the last time this was reviewed, and I believe it was 2012, they said that there were roughly 700 charities that might be able to benefit from this, these smaller charities that were between 500,000 and 1 million. What that turns into today's numbers, I don't know, but those numbers I believe came from uh, the Attorney General's office back in 2012. Okay, and, and speaking as someone who in my day job runs a nonprofit, I know distinctly the difference in cost between having, you know, at the review and a 990 as opposed to having a full audit done. So in, in terms of the effect on the bottom line, it's significant. Um, it, 
would this be following uh, again uh, other states in terms of where their cutoff is? Do you happen to know offhand? Yes, amazingly. So um, the uh, there's a huge number of states that don't even require um, a review or an audit. And that's, I believe, around 23. Um, and then other states uh, that do require one, uh, New York has a million dollar cutoff. Um, New Hampshire has a million dollar cutoff. California's two million, Washington State's three million. We do have some other states in our region that are at 500,000. Um, some are tiered, Massachusetts has a tiered approach. So uh, ours would be a tiered approach as well because we don't require anything for under 200, uh, sorry, for under 500 with this proposal. 500 to 1 million would be, you can have a review or an audit. And then one million or above it is an audit. So I would say that we're um, we'd be a little bit more on the restrictive side than most states are, but we currently are um, as well. So we'd be bringing ourselves more into line with um, those states that um, have been looking at this issue and have decided to have in a review. Uh, but like I said, uh, we have an awful lot that don't even require a review or an audit. New York switched from $750,000 last year up to 1 million. The last time our law was changed was in 2012, I believe. So ours would be an adjustment really to uh, take into consideration that a lot's changed money-wise in that, that period of time. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman D'Agostino. Thank you, Representative. Uh, other questions for Stuart. So I, I just want to make sure. So this is, I'm trying to score your testimony of what we propose. We, we, the draft we have is what? The, I have, um, in, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you clearly, but did you ask about the language? We submitted language in the. I'm, I'm trying to square your language with what we, I just, I don't remember our, I'm trying to find our original oh. draft and how, so, how your language is different. All right, so I apologize for that. Uh, the language that you were most recently given um, is the language that we would be happy with. Oh, so you're not recommending any changes to the draft bill? We are, it's in the, it, so the, in, the, in my testimony, in my written testimony, there is language uh, that would be added to House Bill 5222, which would permit, um, the charitable nonprofits between 500 and 1 million to have the option to choose between the audit or the review. So um, I'm sorry, I, I don't know how to pull up my- Yeah, okay, let me just, so I'm sorry. I, I, this, is, this is my, I'm just trying to find the, I've got your testimony, I'm just trying to- So right in my testimony, there's so language- So we, we proposed, we proposed what? Your, the bill that um, the General Law Committee has does not touch on this issue. It touches on solicitation within small charitable organizations, but it does not touch on audits or reviews. We're recommending that this language be added to the measure uh, to adjust the audit threshold. Gotcha. I, all right. I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I, heard, I thought we had gotten this into the proposed bill and apparently we didn't at all. Okay. Right. That's what I wanted to make sure of. I, I see what you Yeah, we were a little okay. bit too late in getting to you. I apologize that, for that. Uh, that's what the issue was. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, see no questions. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Up next is uh, Maureen Denham. 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 Thank you very much. Um, Senator Maroney, Senator Woodcoast, Representative D'Agostino, Representative Artigliano, and honorable members of the General Law Committee. I am Maureen Sullivan Dinan. I am the past executive director of HAVEN, the Healthcare Professional Assistance Program. Um, I was the CEO of HAVEN through June of 2021. I have here in the room with me, Mariella LaRosa, who is the current CEO. So she would be also available for questions um, at the uh, end of, of my talk. I, I am here to um, 
support House Bill 5223, which is the act expanding the professional assistance program for regulated professions to include pharmacists on condition of not only adequate funding, but now with the recent reach out from Director Marriott of DCP and DCP's testimony today on um, putting the language or doing different language in another, the DCP section, that it doesn't place um, a burden or a duplicate a structure that Haven would not be able to manage. So we are open and we would like to, to work on this with them, but I think those are important considerations. I'm gonna rely on my written testimony because I think in light of these things, that may be the best way for me to use my time is to explain to you how Haven currently works, right? And why that should then be valued and why within the current structure of 5223, DCP does get direct accountability. Um, and I think um, would find that they, uh, have a good um, say or with regard to making sure that pharmacists are properly supported in Connecticut. Haven, uh, first and foremost, we're not a substance use program. We're a comprehensive health and wellness program. We deal with everything from chronic physical illnesses, which are degenerative, usually degenerative neuro conditions, uh, health conditions, cognitive conditions that might be associated with aging, uh, mental health, depression, anxiety with no comorbidities, as well as substance use disorders. And um, I think the lowest threshold for referrals is on substance use disorders. And I think relative to the pharmacists, the most immediate thought people have is because of their occupational access to substances is the importance of their support, not only in the general medical mental health needs, but in this area of substance use. So what happens at Haven? Haven gets multiple calls daily from employers um, asking, we have something going on, we're not sure if we need to refer them to you, um, or we've referred someone to HR, but their behavior is still happening. Should we be you know, using Haven services? We get calls from families, we get calls from friends, we get calls from colleagues, and we get calls from people, right? The individual themselves, who something has happened and they're saying, you know what, I'm at a point where I think I need help. Um, that then generates an intake. And at that intake, there's an uh, eligibility process. And that eligibility process asks questions. Do you have a felony charge pending? Have you had any felony conviction? Do you have a past history of licensure discipline of, of any type? Is there any allegation of patient care issues, patient harm issues? If the answer to any of those questions are yes, Haven is obligated under the language of this current bill to report that regarding a pharmacist to the Department of Consumer Protection. Excuse me, and it is the, just a heads up, you're past three minute markers, so you can start wrapping up, please. Okay, so basically the Department of Consumer Protection gets notice if there's questions of eligibility, they get notice if there's questions of noncompliance, we would have to share records with them. If they have concerns regarding how Haven is operating, they can bring those um, questions to the oversight committee and would address them appropriately. Audits, annual reports, the language says drug control will get a copy of them. Happy, we look forward to sitting down and working out details with all the um, interested parties. Happy to answer questions like Senator Kissel had regarding fees and fee structures and, and how those come about. And we appreciate uh, the legislator's support for mental health for the, our professionals who are taking care of the people we love in Connecticut. Senator Wiggins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, Maureen. I looked online, your testimony hasn't arrived yet for us to, to view. So I'm gonna ask you kind of three questions. You can incorporate your answer uh, if you could touch base on all of those. So you mentioned that you got some calls from folks that say, do we have to report this to you? Uh, so are you a mandatory referral uh, would be kind of question number one. Question number two would be, um, how, does, how does your organization interact or complement uh, an employer's EAP program? And three, uh, do you anticipate, how many clients do you serve and what, what would you base on um, just data from other states maybe by adding uh, pharmacists into the mix? Okay. 
Um, so first of all, regarding mandated reporting, um, in 2015, when the legislature um, did the $5 licensing fee increase to the professions that are covered by Haven, they added a mandated reporting requirement. So prior to 2015, we would get calls saying, you know, am I legally re required to, you know, notify you regarding this person or is it just ethics? Right, because almost all of these professions have an ethical responsibility to seek support and assistance for a colleague who they think is potentially impaired. Um, yet, relying on ethics alone, they tend to not to make the report. So, for um, so that's the answer really to the, to the first question. We satisfy the mandated reporting. Technically, the way the law is written, you're mandated to report to the Department of Public Health, but if the concern uh, arises out of a health issue, a report to Haven satisfies that mandated reporting responsibility. If the person's not compliant with us, it shifts that responsibility to Haven to then make the mandated report to DPH, right? So if we can um, bring that person to remission, help them maintain fitness or wellness and return them to work safely, it doesn't have to go to DPH. How we differ from EAPs, and that's an interesting, I have a whole PowerPoint because I had to do this for the labor unions in Washington on how Haven and EAPs interact and what their differences are. So oftentimes an employer will first, you know, if someone's not doing that well, go to the EAP. The EAP has no responsibility to your license. The EAP also, you don't have to necessarily comply with the EAP. And the EAP um, will not be necessarily reporting back to their organization regarding the, the person's fitness right to practice. It's, um, it's actually probably even a little bit more, um, it's probably a little bit even more protected right than Haven is. Because the premise regarding Haven is that if you've got the privilege of getting a license from the state of Connecticut to provide care to others, that license um, is not a right, right? In order to exercise and have that privilege, part of that is maintaining your fitness to practice and do it wisely. So, so unlike the EAP, the person goes to the EAP, the EAP says to them, listen, you know, you really should be getting care and treatment. You're not reporting back to us. We don't know that you should be practicing. They can say, you know what, I'm going to leave this employer. I'm going to go to another employer. And that other employer had no idea of the problems and that EAP can't require help. So a Haven is a contingency model, right? So they come to us, if you, this is what you need to do for us to be able to support your fitness to practice. You do this, you're not gonna lose your career. You're going to maintain your livelihood. You're gonna continue giving care to the people that you love, right? Take care of your, your pharmaceuticals also appropriately. If you don't though, we are required to notify the Department of Public Health. We're lucky in Connecticut, the Department of Public Health will not automatically discipline the person because oftentimes they're afraid, they're ashamed, they don't know what, you know, they're overwhelmed. And the Department of Public Health will say to them, listen, here's your option. You can, we think what Haven is recommending is reasonable. If you don't want to do this, we're going to go and see if the board or the commission is going to impose a, a monitoring that would not be done confidentially. Um, so that is, um, I think the primary difference is right of the EAP. Haven stays with the person from employer to employer because our responsibility is their fitness to practice and use their license. And I apologize, the last third, the number of participants. The number of participants. So, so that's a, right, that's always the crystal ball question, but I'm gonna go about it in two ways. One is um, the substance use alone in the literature when I was looking, when they asked would he even be willing to take the pharmacist on is anywhere from 7% to 25% seemed to me as I was looking at things, it was more similar to the um, other healthcare professionals we serve, which is probably somewhere within that 10, 10 to 18%. Um, 
So we did it based on a 10%. So we figure that's conservative. And if there's 6,000 um, pharmacists in Connecticut, we'd be thinking we'd be doing good if we could get about, you know, if we could reach 60 of them. Now that does not include people who may be referred to us because of um, cognitive issues. Uh, we've, we've dealt with people with poorly controlled diabetes. So they were falling asleep at work. We've had sleep disorder issues. We've had multiple sclerosis. I, you know, the, the, we've had people referred because people thought they had a substance use disorder. When the evaluation was done, they had brain tumors. So there's a percentage that I'm not including. Um, and there's percentages like 3% are believed to have anxiety or depression, but I think it was Senator Kissel who said with COVID, the depression and the anxiety in the medical community and in the healthcare community is just skyrocketed. Um, there's a percentage of those that have um, advanced into maladaptive coping like self-medication. So we're thinking um, the direct, director Marriott told me that I think currently they may have about 20 people that they would transfer to us. When Haven started, there was in that ballpark area of physicians in the existing program, it very shortly doubled and then it tripled. So I, I'm thinking, you know, for us, we would definitely be getting another service coordinator that would be dedicated to pharmacists. We'd be getting a volunteer pharmacist on the medical review committee to help with um, return to practice. We probably would need a part-time um, clinical staff person to help address because um, the, our, you know, Maria La Rosa, the current CEO, just from January to the end of February, referrals this year increased 62% from this time last year. So I think we're going to begin now to see the fallout from some of the COVID consequences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Kissel. Thank you very much, Chairman D'Agostino. Uh, thank you for coming to testify. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, first of all, in talking to some folks that, are, that have been involved with substance abuse, this is anecdotal, but it sort of reinforces your proximity argument regarding pharmacists. Uh, one of the things that <clears throat> always struck me as odd was the number of reported quote unquote suicides by dentists. And, you know, I said, that's a lucrative, rewarding profession. It's a lot of work that goes into that. <laughs> and I don't know if there's any truth to this at all. Uh, but the individuals that I spoke to, knowing a world that I have no knowledge of regarding uh, people with severe drug dependency or they dabble in, in drug issues, they said, no, it's some of these dentists have proximity to nitrous oxide or whatever they use mm -hmm. to put patients under for their oral surgery. And on the side, they were like fooling around with it and overdosed and died. So the, the people come in and they do the examination and it looks like a suicide where it really was never intentional. That I don't know is true or not, but it's plausible. But when you stated that one of the reasons we have to be concerned about pharmacists in particular is, yeah, they have the anxiety. Yeah, the pandemic has like put a ton of pressure on them, I think. The aging population puts a ton of pressure on them. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the godsend of our big pharma, I mean, there's all sorts of drugs getting on the market. You have to stay abreast of all of this. Mm -hmm. There are interreactions. And so I think that just the fact that with that pressure that these individuals are under, the proximity to these drugs is a temptation that you know, and it's always like the first few times, nobody's gonna, no problem. And then all of a sudden, either an addiction or other complications. So I think there's a need. The part I wanted to stress with you though, is what I'm hearing, and I'm not a leader on this committee. We have great leadership between the chairs and ranking members, but it sounds to me that there's a little bit of a disconnect right now between the department and you folks. And you're sort of saying like the bill as is does enough but they have some concerns. And I just, I would be more comfortable if it was an agreed upon 
resolution. So we have a very short session. I think as the chair has indicated, they wanna start moving bills out in the next week or two. And so I would encourage you to sit down with the folks from DCP and iron this out because I'd rather have before us uh, an agreed upon resolution as opposed to you saying they shouldn't really be overly concerned because this does 90% mm -hmm. of what they're looking for. That's my only, just a regular member rank and file suggestion. Well, and I'm very grateful for that because I, I um, agree with it. And I would appreciate that in order for this to work and to work well, we have to have that symbiosis with um, DCP uh, and the pharmacists. And I wouldn't wanna have something pass and then have us find either inadequate funding or there's an expectation of our structure that puts such a drain on Haven, right? That we diminish or we potentially dilute the services that, we're that we have to provide to everyone. I do wanna thank you, Senator Kissel, for mentioning about the dentist suicide because suicide among healthcare professionals is greater than the general population. So while their genetic predispositions are not greater, the suicide is, and I think it is a, a complex multifactorial issue, but one of the reasons for, for the suicides that has been shared with me is that um, if they get to that point where they feel so ashamed, they're so uncomfortable, they, they know they have a problem, um, family, other people have said, you're a nurse, you're a doctor, you're a pharmacist, you're the first one in our family to do this, and they're so worried about disappointing them. Um, it's, it's hope. When I started working with Haven and I worked on the language that created Haven back in 2007, that was what we really needed to do. We needed to give people a lifeline and give them some hope. Unfortunately, you mentioned the biologic testing and the expenses, and they do add up. A lot of them, they've made a huge investment in their career, so they do get through it. And a lot of times their health conditions have made their fiscal situations difficult to manage. Haven gets no money from that biologic testing. It all goes to the entity doing the testing. But that testing is what gives the data that enables people to be back to work. So I'm, I'm so grateful for um, you know, all, your, all your thoughts, your suggestions, and your understanding. Um, I hope Drug Control will meet with us quickly. I will reach out to them. Um, and then I appreciate Representative Vertigliano and Senator um, Maroney, because if they don't mind, um, we'll definitely get back to them to let them know how we're making out. Well, well, thank thank you for those kind words. I very much appreciate it. You're right; it's it's very much a complex issue. Uh, if one is addicted to any kind of substance, it's very humbling to go and reach out and get help. We we live in a forgiving society, but a lot of times, uh, for individuals, uh, they have pride, they have professional reputation, they have families, and it's very very difficult. And boy, suicide is all too prevalent and it's it's a sort of a, an issue that people are hesitant to talk about. But as I've said in other committees and, and before regarding other bills, if the pandemic has any positive ramifications, it's bringing to the fore issues that have sort of always been there. Uh, but now it's, it's more prevalent. And I think people can accept the fact that we need to get our arms around this. We're all in this together. So uh, I would, I just think it's a matter of life and death. If this bill falls by the wayside and it doesn't come up again until next January, whomever's lucky enough to serve the public and that next session. So now is your window. And I really hope that this gets done this year with the leadership, great leadership of this committee, but thank you for your very kind words. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I'm I'm just I'm a little confused as to what it is. I think you just you so you want to make sure that you you get some more money. I mean to be to be crude about it, right? To be blunt. I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I, I'm I'm I'm. I understand the larger themes you've been testifying to, and the the question. I'm having trouble understanding what your issue is with our proposed bill, aside from you want to make sure that there's a more dedicated funding stream to Haven. So 
um, to help you with that is this, um, the bill that was raised um, gave late fees. So it, it, there's a professional assistance account that exists and it says that late fees would be then put into the professional assistance account and those late fees would be released to Haven. So that's actually what prompted me to call Director Marriott. And I said, what are the late fees? Because at least with the other ones, we know what we can budget for, right? And um, he had not been, um, you know, I guess immediately aware of that. And he said, most pharmacists pay on time. So he couldn't quantify it for me. So that was of great concern, right? Because no organization can do a budget without being able to estimate what dollars they can work with. Yeah. It's which I, I'm not disagreeing with with you at all. I guess I, I you're not you're not suggesting that we shouldn't pass this bill. Uh, I mean, there's there's been no, a I lot see. of support for this bill, and particularly from the pharmacists, and again, sort of consistent with the themes we've heard about wanting to support them and the rationale for including them in this program. So you're not you're not suggesting that. Well, actually, I'll tell you. To me, um, when I started in 2007. And we've worked on the language with all those organizations and everyone came out of the woodworks from 2005 to 2007. There was no funding. And we were told if a fiscal note got put with the bill, it would be killed. And so we all thought very altruistically, oh, people will believe in professional health and they'll find the money, we'll get the money. Well, I'll tell you, um, when I was asked to then step in and take but over in 2008, they couldn't even pay my, my full salary. Um, and I, what I've learned between 2008 and 2021 is passion and volunteers isn't going to be enough to run a program to give um, the accountability and the checks and balances and the help and the support for the people that are needed. And that we have to value our professionals' mental health and we have to value the fact that um, there's a lot of support that's needed to go along with that. So I don't want this done incorrectly. So if there's not the funding to do it right, then maybe to Senator Kissel's point, do you wait till you find the right funding or people are willing to do the funding appropriately? And I think that's something that we'd be sitting down with um, DCP and the pharmacist to talk about. Do you have a dollar amount that you're thinking? Oh boy. Um, well, you know, I think we have a dollar amount, a, a general dollar amount in mind. Um, I'd like to, you know, I'd, I'd like to talk with DCP and the pharmacists about that because we have thought about what kind of staffing we would need to add and what that might cost to do it. Um, it is more than the licensing fee that the other professions are paying, but the licensing fee that the other professions are paying um, is, is inadequate. Now, it went in 2015. There's been no cost of living or other types of increases. So if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to talk the figures with them and then bring it back to the committee with, with the actual number. That's fine for my I, I tend to take a different view, which is I think we should move the concepts forward and, and see how they do in the course of the session rather than oh I see rather than wait, uh, because that would be a death knell to this, uh, which I think has got a lot of merit to it. So I, I, I encourage you to have those conversations and particularly with the pharmacists, uh, because I don't uh, I no disparagement of DCP intended, but I think if you go to DCP saying that you need money, that, that that's not going to go anywhere. Um, so I think you need to work with the professional organization. And if this is something that they truly want, then maybe they'll be willing to uh, increase some fees or direct some fees uh, to it and, and do it that way. I, I appreciate the concern you're raising. Um, my personal perspective is I don't want that concern to necessarily derail uh, further conversation of the concept, but I, I 
I appreciate where you're coming from. I think it's a concern that's shared by a lot of organizations similar to yours uh, that we've heard about, not only in this committee, but certainly every legislator. I see Senator Austin's on our committee. I, I know she gets these calls, uh, these sort of um, uh, concerns raised at approaches all the time because it's it's something that we we put a lot of um, work on our nonprofits and other organizations like yours and then don't necessarily fund everything 100%. Uh, and we've got to balance that for the Senator Kissel's uh, point. Right. So in light, of, in light of that insight, and I really appreciate your advice because, you know, this is not my forte. Um, you know, we estimated that we think $180,000 we would be able to do um, the pharmacists with as robust and as good a program as we are doing with the others and how that would split out between um, the participant fees that get charged directly to the participants and what monies can be found elsewhere is what would have to be worked on between DCP and the others. So, you know, you know, and with the budget you all are dealing with, that probably doesn't seem like a lot of money. We've always been run, running on a shoestring. So for us, you know, that's a lot of money. Representative Tigliano, I'll see you about your hand up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say on the outset, I, I really do appreciate Chairman D'Agostino's ability to sift through legislation and analyze it. And uh, his analysis of a lot of things kind of cuts through a lot of stuff that we all think wasn't there or we didn't even realize was there. I've come to really appreciate it over the years. And he brought up a couple of excellent points that made me ask a question. So, you know, I've read the legislation and I actually don't remember... Uh, where the fee is. Is the fee for the doctors in statute or is that in regulation? I'm, I know this is about pharmacists. I'm talking about how you collect money on doctors. Where did that fee originate? So the fee originates in statute. And, and when we were doing that, we were told you had to be sure it was in the statute and you had to have a specific line item that you could not have the money going to the general fund. So for each of the other organizations, there was a $5 licensing fee increase. Um, and then there's, the, I think it's 19A12C that created the professional assistance account and directed that that, that that licensing fee increase would be placed into that account, that the commissioner of the Department of Public Health has to certify the amount in that account. And then they transfer the funds quarterly to Haven. And those funds approximate about $750,000 a year. So it's about 50% of the budget for the other. My understanding was that when we were considering this legislation prior to it being written, that we were writing in that fee for the pharmacists into the legislation. And you're telling me now that it, that doesn't appear in there? We did not. No, it was not in there. So there was no licensing but fee if for the we pharmacy were to copy here. What we did for the doctors and put it in for the pharmacies what right. would five dollars per license equate to only thirty thousand dollars if it's um six thousand pharmacists in the state of connecticut and and that's where there's so much extra reporting to dcp and things that that thirty thousand wouldn't be enough i'm worried to senator kissel's point that if we have to make up the difference by charging the poor, the pharmacist who's referred to Haven, their administrative fee would be, you know, a burden, not manageable. So um, I don't think $5 is adequate. I don't think $5 is adequate though for physicians or nurses any longer, frankly, right? Um, but the pharmacist at $5, $30,000, it would be, um, Haven wouldn't be able to do it with that amount um, unless there was some other way that these two other groups are thinking that they can get funding that I don't know about. Well, I appreciate the discussion. Uh, I think this is important and uh, we need to get it right. So I really would like to work with you and the pharmacists, really, because they're the ones that have to pay it, let's be honest, and what the number is so we can pass this. I, I don't want to see this get stalled especially now with the suicide treatment, all the other things that Senator Kissel brought up that we didn't even contemplate, quite frankly, when we were when we started this process, it really was about addiction and other things. But he's right. It's really about a lot of things. And uh, 
I'm will certainly hopefully pass this out of committee, but I, was, I would like to get it right and pass it properly. But I mean, if, if the pharmacists and the doctors agree to a different amounts, then fine. I, I think we should do it. So I appreciate the time. I really appreciate uh, Representative D'Agostino diving in there a little bit and, and trying to make this better. So uh, um, thank yeah, you. I, for, further to that, Representative Sibliano, can you, can you, I think Brian Valco's on the line or LCO, can you just make sure, maybe send him an email. I want to make sure that at the very least our bill has the provision on the fees. And even if we set it at $5, we've at least put the mechanism in there and then the number can be played with. But let's at least make sure we've got the funding mechanism in place that mirrors what is in with the physicians. Will do. Great suggestion. And this is the, I know this is probably, if you could put it in at $10, that would be so much better because for someone, for someone maybe, says you, don't, you don't usually advocate for this you, you do no, <laughs> we're, we're going to play with the language I, I don't mean to interrupt Thank mr you. chairman but quite frankly maureen if, if you could get the pharmacies to agree to a number right. i'm sure the chairman and the rest of the committee would yeah. like fine okay. um, or something more i mean you know i think that that's right but it, it may be that we have to look wholesale at that fee structure as well and maybe that's something we do or don't do in a short session but at the very least i want to make sure what we're put proposing here at least structurally um, has the right uh, uh, provision in place, so. Thank you so much. Thank you. We Thank will you very, very, very helpful. Thank you. Uh, and we do have your, your written testimony is online. I did find it if folks are interested. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, on, the, uh, okay. it's on the website. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Sam. Next is Janet. Um, Koskowitz. There you are, Janet. Just make sure you hit unmute. There, there we you go. go. <laughs> All right, you're on. Thank you, uh, Senator Maroney and Whitkos and Representatives Diagostino and Ruchigliano and honorable members of the General Law Committee. Thank you for um, letting me speak today. My name is Janet Kazakowicz. I'm a registered pharmacist in the state of Connecticut, but I also serve as a treasurer of Haven. Um, and I thank you for the opportunity. I fully do support Ray's bill 5223. Um, if we can identify some reliable and adequate sources of funding through this all. Um, as a member of the executive board and a pharmacist, I've sought to really educate the board on the need for pharmacists is perhaps why we're here today. I like to take a little credit for that. Um, I'm also a past director of pharmacy um, in the state of Connecticut at multiple hospitals, most recently at Yale New Haven. And I've seen firsthand the toll that substance use disorders and mental health has had on pharmacists and pharmacy students. And one key risk factor that never really gets talked about aside from the access is that pharmacists and pharmacy students have a mistaken belief that their knowledge about medications will keep them from developing an addiction and that couldn't be farther from the truth. And the question I think for many pharmacy managers and, and deans at the colleges of pharmacy is not will a pharmacist develop an addiction, but what do they do with it when they, it becomes known to them? Um, so unlike the rest of the professionals in Connecticut, as we've heard from so many other people who testified today, um, pharmacists aren't able to partake in that. So I want to really look at two recent cases in the state of Connecticut. It's in my written testimony, um, but I'd like to reiterate them. In June of 29, 2021, the Department of Justice notice posted um, a pharmacist from Connecticut sentenced to three years in prison for forging prescriptions to acquire narcotics and benzodiazepines or anxiolytic drugs. But one of the most compelling occurrences involved a pharmacist in 2020 who was sentenced to four years and three months in prison for tampering with and stealing narcotics um, to uh, intended for terminally ill cancer patients um, for pain management. And several family members then went on to testify at the trial and talked about how the pain management was ineffective for their dying family members. And during the case, it was revealed that laboratory samples of the vials that the pharmacist tampered with had all the active drug removed and it was replaced with saline. Um, in both cases, this pharmacist had been discharged from prior employment for controlled substance related violations. 
So one can only speculate about whether mandatory reporting and access to Haven would have resulted in a different outcome for these pharmacists and the patients and families that entrusted them with their care. Um, I'm also the treasurer of Haven, so I have another perspective as well. I oversee the fiscal management of Haven, and our budget consists of reliable and unreliable funding. Um, our reliable revenue source, as Maureen mentioned, comes from the $5 per licensee fee that we get from the Department of Public Health. And this represents a little more than half of our annual budget. The rest of the budget is really um, funded through unreliable sources, and that comes from our participant fees, which um, Senator Kissel had it referred to. Uh, we're required to do a lot of fundraising and any returns on any investments that we have. And as you all know, a healthy business model is one that's based on reliable revenue sources um, and covers our operating expenses and hopefully contributes to a surplus to help us benefit our mission here at Haven. Um, but the current licensing fees don't really cover the operating expenses, which Maureen was reiterating to, nor does it provide for a needed buffer for the unexpected, such as a pandemic. This year, we were lucky enough to um, receive funding through the COVID Payroll Protection Program, which actually enabled us uh, to... Excuse me, Mr. Kos um, Ms. Koskowitz, um, you're at the three-minute marker. If you can start wrapping up, please. Yes, I will. So we were able to balance our budget this year. Um, I think as a pharmacy manager, one of the toughest decisions I had um, was to confront an employee with an alcohol substance use disorder um, or a mental illness, knowing that my only recourse was to refer them to an employee relations specialist and probably a, a family medical leave. I think, um, you know, what ends up happening for us is that we feel like we haven't done our job and that... Um, these people are going to go on to be someone else's problem. And as you can see from the prior two references, they, those two people did. And so we can, you know, the struggle for pharmacists and the organizations that they work for is very real. Uh, we will continue on this journey as a profession and it, it, if we as a profession and use our government leaders um, don't help us to fight the right the course here. Um, for health and wellness resources, confidential. Let me get to uh, let me get to Senator Kissel. Has got a question for you. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple quick points. First of all, uh, thank you for raising yet another issue. That uh, here we are talking about pharmacists, and uh, it's actually this could go all the way down to young people uh, studying pharmacy. Uh, and again, you're at sort of the peak of your knowledge and just thinking that, hey, I, I do, I'm not afraid of this stuff because I just took a class on it. I'm in the middle of it. I'm getting straight A's uh, and drugs and alcohol can be devious that way because you think you can handle it. Uh, but then all of a sudden it's handling you. Uh, and uh, it's that's and I draw a distinction. I just want to make this clear. You used in the second case, the example of someone sort of swapping the active components of a medication with saline. And to me now an innocent party, probably in their, in their dying stages of life, uh, wasn't getting the pain medication they needed. So that's a behavior that affected an innocent third party. I, I think that that's far more serious and probably uh, justified a four year prison term. Uh, but I know that uh, we have these debates in the Judiciary Committee all the time. Uh, we put forward fentanyl legislation and I saw it, my mental thing is that I draw the line between a dealer uh, and someone who's addicted and I'm much more sympathetic to the, to the person who's addicted. And here you're sort of like melding them if you have access uh, and so to the extent a group like Haven, which I mistaken in, in my early life for New Haven, has nothing to do with New Haven, uh, nothing against the city of New Haven. But my question, uh, Mr. Chair, is this. You are a pharmacist. You're here testifying on this bill. I appreciate your testimony. It's very helpful. But since pharmacists aren't part of the Haven network, how in the world did you end up as the treasurer and on the board? And, and, and how did that work? What drew you to Haven in the first place? What drew me to Haven in the first place is I was a, I've been in behavioral health prior to going into management. And I sit as the, um, the community member on the board. And I was referred by someone who was already on the board who I'd worked with previously. 
Thank you very much. And I think, you know, you, you caused me to think of something else that I hadn't thought of earlier, which really, and I agree with uh, Chairman D'Agostino and, and Ranking Member Rutigliano that I'd rather see a number put in and move this baby along because I, I just think that lives are at risk. And if there's a hiatus till next January, and then even if it's January, who knows when the bill gets through, uh, there's lives in the balance. And with pharmacists in particular, to the extent they're, they're playing with drugs that may be bound for someone else, there are innocent third parties that could be deleteriously affected through no fault of their own. And so to the extent we get rapid and compassionate care for individuals that find themselves tempted or hooked on their pharmacy pharmaceuticals that they deal with on a daily basis for whatever reason. Uh, you know, there's other people involved in this as well. And so that uniform verse now just got bigger for me as far as the need for this legislation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Appreciate it. Further I questions or comments? Are you going? I'd like to make a comment. You know, I think what's important here with these two cases is that both of them had been removed from their prior places of employment for similar issues. And if re mandatory reporting and pharmacists were involved in Haven, they probably never would have gotten to those prison sentences. And I think that's our goal, early intervention. That's, that's the magic of Haven is the early intervention. And I understand that you know it depends on where they are in their disease state, whether early intervention is most successful. But people who are in this journey for a while and are not open to the fact that they have a problem, once their behaviors change to the point where someone has to report them, most of them are very successful in the program. And, and I think these two, two pharmacists probably would have. I, I would put my money on it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, seeing no further questions or comments, thank you very much. Yeah. Next is uh, Steph Loon. Loon. Thank you. Um, my name is Steph Luan and Chairman Diagostino Maroney, um, Ranking Members Whitcoat and Brutigliano, and distinguished members of the General Law Committee. My name again is Steph Luan, and I am a licensed pharmacist practicing at Yale New Haven Health System. I am also the legislative chair of the Connecticut Society of Health System Pharmacists. I am pleased to testify on behalf of Yale New Haven Health System in strong support of Senate Bill 186, an act concerning collaborative drug therapy management agreements and policies. And I also offer strong support for House Bill 5223, an act expanding the professional assistance program for regulated professions to include pharmacists. I have submitted detailed testimony, so I will use my time here today to summarize. Pharmacists are one of the most highly trained and underutilized healthcare professionals. We graduate with a doctor of pharmacy degree, often participate in one or two years of additional residency training, and sometimes complete fellowship training before settling into our clinical roles. What I am asking you to support today is straightforward. Pharmacists and prescribing practitioners want to have the opportunity to provide high quality care for as many patients as they can. Currently, each individual patient must be referred to the pharmacist to be eligible for care within the current collaborative practice or collaborative drug therapy management um, or CDTM agreements in our state. Each time a national guideline is updated or a new and innovative medication therapy is approved, hundreds of prescribing practitioners and pharmacists are required to re-sign a new CDTM agreement. In some specialty practices, new therapies are approved several times per month. Uh, next, the referral order must be updated for each patient who has previously been referred but are still engaged in care with the pharmacist. When scaled across health systems that serve tens of thousands of patients per year, this required significant administrative work that is truly unnecessary. Ultimately, prescribing practitioners and pharmacists want to be able to provide high quality patient-centered care. We can do this safely and effectively if a caregiving institution is able to outline policies for a simpler process to handle these updates as organizations routinely do for other practices through PNT committees. 
Updating the statute will also help us to recruit top talent as pharmacists are looking to settle down in states that allow them to do what they are trained for, help optimize patient care through collaboration with multidisciplinary healthcare teams without excessive administration, administrative burden. I would also like to offer strong support for House Bill 5223. Um, this act would add pharmacists to the list of healthcare professionals as you have heard by countless uh, other supporters today. Um, these pharmacists would be able to participate in assistance programs of, as a confidential alternative to public disciplinary action for professionals suffering from chemical dependency, emotional or behavioral disorder, or physical or mental illness. Thank you very much for your time today, and please let me know what additional information I can provide. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Oh, wait. You good, Senator? I have a question, Mr. Sure, Chair. Please. Yeah, I just, uh, I know that you stated it, uh, ma'am, doctor, uh, at the beginning of your testimony. And uh, I don't know if you're here on behalf of just those organizations, or are you also representing the position of Yale New Haven Hospital itself? Or health network, you yeah, know so I, that that whole thing changes so much. I can't even keep up. No, I know. Uh, thank you for clarifying. So I am representing Yale New Haven Health System as well as myself. Okay, great. Thank you. That's a big deal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Luan. Uh, and I don't see any other questions for you. Thank you. I'm going to hand off briefly to Senator Maroney so I can vote another committee. I'll be right back, Senator. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clerk, I believe next up is Aaron uh, Parrott. Yes. Good afternoon. Um, thank you to all members of this General Assembly for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Aaron Parrott, owner and operator of Ala Mac, a licensed cottage food operation based in Berlin, specializing in French macarons. I'm also an executive chef of a large hospital with over 15 years of professional food service experience and over 10 years with a nationally recognized food safety manager certification. I also hold a degree in food service management and science from Johnson & Wales University. I'm here to speak with you all in regard to the Senate Bill 187, asking you to lift the prohibition on shipping and removing the gross sales cap for cottage food operations altogether. I started on the Mac in 2019 after baking for some friends and demanded that the ULA took off. Before I knew it, I had her registered as a cottage food operator and formed an LLC. I was designing packaging, investing in more equipment and participating in local markets and fundraisers for local charities and historical societies, including the Noah Webster House and Simsbury Historical Society. And then COVID-19 happened. Despite the vast economical burdens, Alamac continued to grow. We moved to support first responders, essential workers and our healthcare heroes, and even had an order for the governor's staff. Uh, while our business and family grew, I found myself unemployed like so many in 2020 while my wife was three months pregnant with our first child. I was faced with a choice, either search for another job or grow Alamac. Unfortunately, due to the sales cap on cottage food operations, I was forced to pursue other employment um, and not grow my small business. It would be impossible to have a livable income for my family with a minuscule sales cap that after subtracting cost of ingredients, package materials, vehicle wear and tear, taxes, license fees, market entry fees, and equipment purchases, left only a small amount of actual profit, let alone a paycheck. Removing the sales capital on many cottage operators to support themselves without having to face the massive financial risk of starting a brick and mortar store, especially in today's market. Many customers have asked to ship macarons to loved ones they have not been able to visit for years due to the pandemic, but have had to turn away their business because of an arbitrary prohibition on shipping non-hazardous items. I've had to turn away not only thousands of dollars in business, but see and hear the disappointment of parents wanting to send their children their favorite dessert and being could not send anything for no really good reason. We are losing our ability to survive. Uh, the concern with shipping food product is to protect consumers from foodborne illness caused by food being left in unsafe temperatures. However, the requirements for any product prepared in a cottage food operation is that the item must be non-potentially hazardous, not needing temperature control. Shipping would not in any way affect the safety of our products. Your local cottage food operators are imploring that you, our legislators, lift the frivolous restrictions on shipping and remove the sales cap in its entirety, allowing us to support our communities, markets, historical societies, pursue our passions, and make Connecticut a great state for growing small businesses and families. Thank you all, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I see Senator Whitcoast has his hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Aaron, for hanging on to testify today. My question to you is, um, 
How long have you been operating uh, Alamac for? And have you ever been visited by the health department? At your in Berlin, I guess it's where your facility is. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we started in 2019, and uh, I haven't had any visit from a health department um, during the application process. We do have to check with local municipalities and see if there is an existing restriction or anything that says we cannot start them. And I haven't received, I have, I've, I've contacted the local regulatory and they had said there was nothing against it. And they're, so they were very happy. Any complaints uh, that you're aware of that somebody would cause an investigation? Uh, no, you, I haven't just, had any complaints at all. Um, and just like um, uh, Jennifer McDonald was saying earlier, it, it, I, I've talked to other cottage operators, <clears throat> excuse me, and nobody has ever really had any complaints or any reports of foodborne illness. Um, it, with the, the types of food we produce, they are not subject to refrigeration. Um, a lot of recipes are tested. Um, anything that is might even remotely have an ingredient in it that could be considered potentially hazardous. Uh, we use the book um, that is actually listed on the Connecticut portal of recipes that have been tested to be not potentially hazardous. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Kissel. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Maroney. Uh, thank you for coming to testify, sort of a melding of everything we had before us today, uh, healthcare and the food situation. Uh, I'm just wondering, and by the way, stellar resume, uh, Johnson & Wales, highly regarded. I think it's, what, it's number one. Uh, it's one of those, uh, if not number one. Uh, my my uh, opinion's a little biased, but always. <laughs> it, it's absolutely number one, Senator. Just there you go. It. From, from one of our ranking members, Reticoli, Representative Reticoliano, I take that as gospel. Uh, alumni, by the way. <laughs> oh, all right. There, well, there you go. Speaks for itself. I'm just wondering, just to be, you know, completely upfront, which I try to be, uh, I'm sort of more comfortable with doubling it from 50 to 100 and sort of seeing, do, that's just me, I'm just ranking member, I'm a ranking rank and file member, not a ranking member, uh, to see how it goes. But I'm just wondering, there's been a lot of proponents that say, take, take it off completely. And I'm just wondering, do we get any revenue off this system? Do you have any interreaction with the Department of Revenue Services such that if you become overnight a million dollar business, we're losing revenues or something? I, I just don't know how that end of it works. So um, as an LLC and selling a product, I am required to hold a Connecticut sales tax permit. So I have to apply for that every time it comes up for renewal. I have to report it every uh, quarter. Um, so there, it is definitely taxable um, expenses. Absolutely. The, the state is getting a, a good amount of revenue from it, from any registered business, I should say. So, and uh, <clears throat> Chairman D'Agostino brought to our attention that one of our illustrious members is Senator Austin, who is co-chair of the Appropriations Committee. If we did take the lid off, as I'm sort of reluctant to do, but who knows, the druthers of this committee and the leadership, would the state perhaps gain further revenues? Would it? Would the fiscal note probably be in the black that a net potential gain? I would have to say yes. Um, I collect sales tax from every transaction that I do, um, and I report it uh, along with my quarterly taxes that I'm required to. So, absolutely, the state would definitely in increase their their taxable revenue from it. Okay, I just think that's another piece of information that's important. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Senator Kissel. Are there any further questions? Okay, here we go. Thank you very much for your testimony. Maybe we thank can you, use everyone. that for the Haven Bill on, on pharmacists and just balance this all out today. <laughs> Happy to support uh, healthcare wherever needed. There you go. All right, uh, Mr. Clerk, next. I believe it's uh, Marie Renoir. Renoir. Uh, yes, uh, Renee. I'm um, Marie uh, Renoir. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Chairman D'Agostino and Maroney, Ranking Members Whitecoast and Rutigliano, and distinguished members 
of the General Law Committee. My name is Marie Renauer. I'm a licensed pharmacist here in the state and also a member of the Connecticut Society of Health System Pharmacists, or CSHP. I'm here to testify on behalf of myself and also CSHP in strong support for raise bill number 186, an act concerning collaborative drug therapy management or CDTM agreements and policies. Uh, my current role is as a health system pharmacy associate director. I have the opportunity um, to collaborate with other healthcare and community leaders to develop innovative team-based care models and also improve patient access to care and better outcomes for our state's residents. Um, in my career in prior hats, um, since removed, I've also been fortunate to have firsthand experience um, practicing in CDTMs in various states. Um, state scope of practice is what dictates pharmacist law, so it can vary from state to state. So it's been interesting to have to uh, apply for licensure um, and take different um, state laws that are more challenging than the original clinical boards, but I'm happy to say that I passed and, and Connecticut's were some of the toughest. Um, under uh, CDTM agreements, I've seen these benefits to patients and clinicians where lesser administrative burdens really facilitated increasing patients' access to care, improved health outcomes, and um, I think a very timely topic as we talk about um, the, the risk to our healthcare workers, including pharmacists, of being uh, burnt out is, is really improving clinician and care team well being by providing holistic support not only to the patients, but also the care team. So, this bill as proposed does not change the pharmacist's scope of practice. What it aims to really do is eliminate the unnecessary administrative burdens and really allow care teams to prioritize patients over paperwork. Um, I've outlined in detail my submitted written. And in my submitted and written testimony, how the administrative burdens can just be reduced. Um, and uh, fortunately, um, some of the benefits were really just highlighted by the testimony that Dr. Steph Luan just provided. Um, so what I'll add to that, um, in addition um, to what Dr. Luan said, is the proposed bill revisions will have an immediate and significant impact in improving equitable access to care for the state's residents. Um, we've all unfortunately seen that through the COVID-19 pandemic, access to care and treatment for COVID has not been equitable in some of our communities leading to poor outcomes for certain patient populations. Um, by removing some of these administrative burdens, operationalizing CDTM, such as allowing patient access by eligible diagnosis um, versus individual uh, clinician-driven patient referral, and also allowing caregiving institutions to create policies on how to manage patient populations, um, I really feel that timely access to needed care and treatments for COVID can be immediately improved. Uh, many of these new therapies are now available for patients to receive on an outpatient basis, um, and also um, either to take it home and be self-administered, um, which can keep them from being admitted to the hospital for care. So we definitely have felt um, the change over the last two years in care being um, in the hospital versus being shifted to the outpatient setting. Um, so by being able to keep patients healthier at home, we are really able to increase access for routine and urgent care for non-COVID related conditions. Um, lastly, I feel there's also a direct impact on the workforce in our state. Um, in my current position, I've unfortunately seen very highly qualified pharmacists. Excuse um, me, Ms. Um, Ms. Renoir, I'm just gonna have you got um, your past three minute markers so you can start wrapping up, please. Thank you. Sure, I, I would just like to say I'd like to keep Connecticut residents and those we train here in our state um, to take care of our patients. And I appreciate um, your time today and consideration of my testimony. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Great, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Senator Whitgos. Thank you, thank you for, for coming in and providing your testimony today. And I, only because of your profession, I have to ask you if you've had the chance to listen to some of the other um, testimony that was provided today regarding adding the uh, pharmacists the into the ability to go referral to the Haven. Um, just your thoughts on that, if, if you may. Yes, of course. Um, I, I would certainly support that. Um, being um, a pharmacy leader and administrator, certainly seeing um, the, the burdens on care teams even before this pandemic. I think burnout was in healthcare providers um, was significant before and, and is at a tremendous level now. We're seeing people leaving healthcare altogether, not just pharmacy, um, and, and significant mental health um, burden as well. So I would be supportive of including pharmacists as well um, in the Haven Treatment Program. In the bill that you testified on, uh, you said in your experience, you've, you've uh, had to work in a variety of different states. How, how does Connecticut, uh, in your experience, fare in our regulatory processes? Do you see room for great improvement? Are we on the right track? Uh, just kind of trying to gauge where we are. 
Sure, I think we're definitely on the right track in, in the scope of, of practice. Um, it's just really those administrative burdens and paperwork. And we've really seen with the pandemic um, that we're getting enough paperwork from, from insurance companies um, and being able to, to justify the care and the medications patients need. So um, putting more paperwork onto clinicians, um, their nurses, a pharmacists really decreases um, our, our ability to take care of patients and also makes us um, have to, to seek out additional resources to take care of that administrative burden. I'll share um, the, the scope of practice and what pharmacists can do is progressive. And, and coming from, uh, I'll share from the Midwest, um, I was concerned about coming to the East Coast because I'd heard it was not as progressive, but Connecticut is, is a, a perfect little island that, that, I, that I ended up in where um, I feel we, we are really advanced in care and providing team-based care. Um, but, but I'll share the first place during residency I was on a collaborative with. I, I really had never seen the collaborative. As a resident physician, not because I was deep into residency, but because there was not the administrative burdens of physical sign off. We had a medical director, a pharmacy director that was able to sign off on behalf of credentialed um, pharmacists within the organization. We, we had committees and infrastructure in place to, to approve the protocols that everyone agreed to work under. So I, I literally never saw what was in scope. It was part of my training and credentialing, um, but I did not as, as a pharmacist have to go find and drive across the state to get signatures from clinicians. Very well understood. And we're, we're doing our best to try to ease some of the regulations while still protecting the, uh, you know, the patients and the, the clients. And, and, and I've only been a resident since 2016, so I appreciate um, uh, the support and, and all the, the changes made thus far. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Wickos. Are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, hearing none, Dr. Renault, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Okay, Mr. Clerk, uh, next, I believe we have uh, Steve Burkhart. Yes. Hi, Mr. Burkhardt. Please uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Senator. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for your time today. Uh, my name is Steve Burkhardt, and I'm here on behalf of Bit Corporation in support of SB 185, an act concerning counterfeit, novelty, and unsafe lighters. In 2021, I retired from Bic after 28 years of service as in-house counsel, including over a decade as Vice President, Administration, General Counsel, and Secretary. I chair the International Organization for Standardization's Working Group for Lighters, and I'm president of the U.S. Lighter Association. BIC has a long and proud history in Connecticut. BIC's lighter factory has called Milford home for nearly 60 years. Shelton is our North American headquarters. Every day, more than 400 Connecticut employees including over 100 United Steelworkers, support the manufacture, distribution and sale of big products throughout the world, including the highest quality lighter and the only one of its kind made in the USA. SB 185 seeks to support the efforts of our employees and consumers by ensuring that lighters sold in Connecticut are safe, meet long established ASDM industry standards, respect intellectual property, and don't mimic toys that can confuse parents and injure children. Without the protections afforded by this bill, consumers will continue to experience unsafe lighters in the marketplace sold by both brick and mortar retailers and online merchants. Today and for many years, unsafe counterfeit and novelty lighters have been purchased unknowingly and unintentionally by consumers in Connecticut Sometimes consumers are attempting to purchase an authentic BIC lighter only to be fooled by a cheap knockoff, often imported from Asia. BIC has tirelessly sought to promote rules that prevent, prevent or at least diminish these unsafe practices. BIC brought an unfair competition claim before the International Trade Commission against Chinese manufacturers counterfeiting the world famous and protected Bic lighter made in Milford. 
Epic even sued some of its own customers to send a message to the industry that sales of such unsafe products will not be tolerated. BIC won the lawsuit and works directly with U.S. Customs to train staff at U.S. ports to reduce the importation of unsafe and counterfeit lighters. BIC has invested millions of dollars, including over $50 million just in the last six years in its state-of-the-art factory in Milford to ensure every BIC lighter meets or exceeds all industry standards, including ASTM which has guided our industry since the early 1970s. And working with the U.S. Lighter Association and others, BIC has supported state laws prohibiting the sale of novelty lighters throughout the U.S. SB 185 will provide additional resources to consumers, retailers, distributors, and BIC by requiring manufacturers to respect long-established ASDM industry standards that ensure safety. And when they don't, Government, fire officials, concerned companies, consumers can bring a case against those who commit the violations. Please support our efforts to improve safety for Connecticut residents. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I, I see Senator Whitcoast has his hand raised. Senator Whitcoast and then uh, Senator Kissel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Burkhart, for testifying today. Uh, I didn't know there was a, a U.S. Lighters Association in the state, and I was reading through the bill, um, and I just had a question uh, regarding, say, a novelty um, lighter where it talks about it can't resemble anything, but sometimes you, if you go to a gas station or a different, uh, you know, very prevalent in our CBD stores now, they have lighter, novel, I'll call them novelty lighters, that have different designs on them. And it says, I think in the bill that you cannot give a free sample. So do your salespeople, when they go to these locations, uh, similar to um, other industries, I don't think we've ever barred uh, a free sample to give, but this would uh, cause that to happen. Is that something that is a, a norm across the industry, across the states? No, our sales teams are not typically providing free samples. If you're at a trade show, I think samples are provided but on a routine sales call. Um, what which I think you're referring to, though, however, is not a traditional lighter with a design on it. You know, we can sort of close our eyes and picture the Bic lighter. Everybody knows the shape and size of it. To put a picture on it, that's not novelty. It's when you literally take something from the Fisher Price, you know, barnyard farm animal type toy and make that into a lighter. That's the one that's so concerning. So if someone were inclined to hand out such a thing as a, as a, I guess as a, a giveaway, I, I think we would want to prohibit that too. It's the confusion that we're concerned about. And is that prevalent in the state that there's novelty lighters that are being sold? I mean, what happens if they, if they are stamped as being safe, but under the definition, it's now considered novelty. You, you want to ban those? Yeah, I think we do. I think if you have something that's in the shape of, of a toy, I mean, let's, let's, let's think about if there's a Mickey Mouse lighter out there, and there are, you know, Disney's not licensing, licensing that, obviously. So someone's just stealing the IP and then putting a lighter inside the, the figurine that is a Mickey Mouse lighter. And then that can cause some people wouldn't even expect that thing to be a lighter. So that's what we're trying to prohibit. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Kissel. Thank you, Chairman Maroney. I'm just wondering what the letters, what is it, ASDM or what does that stand for? Yeah, that's the American Society for Testing and Materials. It's been around a long, long time and industries, all kinds of industries follow those standards, help create them with government authorities like CPSC, DOT, whatever the um, agency is. So the pipes under the ground in the streets that provide water and gas to a lighter in your kitchen, to the stoves, the ice makers, you know, tires on your car, these kinds of things are all promoted with industry standards, ASTM being one of them. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Uh, thank you, Senator Kissel. Representative Acker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your time here today. So there are so many different types of lighters. Is there 
and out there there's tons and tons of designs of them you know novelty novelty this kind of this language what i'm reading here pretty much would make them all um you know not legal essentially i'm just curious as to um what other states have done in this mode if you would obviously you would know as being the, the, probably the largest lighter company in the world so is there other states that have taken this approach similar to this yes there's uh we're, i think we're closer to 20 states now than uh it's about 17 or 18 so a number of states have um i think one of the best in terms of showing uh, what a good example of a novelty lighter is and, and what the rules are is New York. They have a website um, that shows just, um, and it's what you'd imagine. It looks like a series of toys in a toy box, but they're actually lighters. So um, states have been quite deliberate in singling out those unique products as the ones that are prohibited. And then as I say, a traditional lighter that you know may have you know, a Hartford yard goat emblem on it, that'd be fine. Um, we just don't want it to be a goat's head, obviously. Okay. And then a follow-up, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate that, Steve, I again, appreciate that answer. Um, so is there, you mentioned other, um, other countries making it, are there other United States uh, companies that are making these, uh, these uh, lighters that we may be um, negatively impacting uh, business-wise with this legislation? The, the only U.S. Uh, company that makes disposable lighters is BIC Corporation in Milford. Um, there is the, 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 um, the old-style refillable lighter, the Zippo lighter that we all probably sure. know. Yeah. That, that's made in Pennsylvania, but that's, that's a different lighter altogether. It's more expensive. It, sure. You have to refill it, put in flint and that sort of thing. Know it, know it very well. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Steve, thank you for, your, uh, for being here. Thank you, Representative. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Ackert. Uh, Steve, I have a few questions for you. So uh, with New York, you said they have examples on the website. Does that mean they have rulemaking authority or was that in the statutes of which types of lighters were prohibited or is the attorney general or consumer protection, are they uh, empowered in New York to put examples on the website? It, they evolved that um, prohibition through the legislative process in New York and that what you see there is the uh, fruits of that labor. Uh, the US Lighter Association participated with them in order to help make sure, as the states do this, we're trying to make sure the language is as close to consistent as possible. Okay, thank you. And then I, I guess, <clears throat> you know, how would enforcement of this work? And would it require additional staff for either the fire marshals or, or DCP, consumer protection? Well, th thanks. Thanks for that question, Senator, because I think just to be clear, we have enjoyed enormous support across the country from the likes of fire marshals, consumer protection agencies, even consumers, our union employees. Um, the thought that we would need any help just knowing if these kinds of products are there, we, we don't. We know they're there. And folks routinely let us know. They even buy them and send them into us and say, hey, is this you or did you know this is there? So we appreciate all of that sort of great resource. What I think we need is something explicit. That's what we're asking for to say that this can't be done. You know, you have to follow the standards. You can't infringe someone's IP. You shouldn't have a Mickey Mouse lighter that, that a parent might think is a toy for a child. That's what we're looking for. And then a consumer, a company, if the fire marshal wanted to, or whomever would have the right to sue. Okay, thank you for that. And then, I mean, you mentioned it was 17 or 18 other states who have uh, similar laws to this, but is, is this something that should, I mean, would be better to be done on a federal level? I, you know, it would be great if the if the federal government were to engage on this. I think the current administration um, would could be a help to us. It's just that CPSC is often one of the agencies that lags in terms of its appointments when uh, administrations change. 
And, and that's the case today. So they're not even fully staffed. They're still short a commissioner. So if they engage on this, that'd be great. But in the meantime, you know, we need action now and Connecticut's our home and we'd like to start here. So thank you. Like I said, there are many things that would be better if the federal government would, would act, but it's left up to the states. So um, I don't have any further questions. Does anyone else have any uh, questions? Okay, hearing none, thank you very much. I, I, I think your... Representative Ackert's hand might be up unless it's a mistake, Mr. Chairman. I had asked my question, but thank you. I didn't, I didn't unraise it. Thank you, David. Great, thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you, and everyone. So, Mr. Burkhart, Burkhart, thank you very much. And thanks to Big Ben for all they do for the community. Uh, being a long time Milford resident as well as representing Milford. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thanks everyone, bye-bye. I believe uh, Chairman D'Agostino is going to be the closer and <laughs> take over for the last last Thank time. You for, Thank you for stopping there, uh, uh, Senator. Uh, Sam, who's next? Last up is Amber Tucker. Good afternoon. Last but not least, I sure. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Senator Maroney, am I good to go? Yep, you are, thank you. Okay. Uh, Senator Maroney, Senator Whitcoast, Representative Diacostino, Representative Retech Leone, and honorable members of General Law Committee, thank you for the opportunity to offer testimony regarding House Bill 5222 for today's public hearing. I understand that earlier today, you also heard from Bonnie Stewart from the CTCPA, and we have a very similar message. Um, my name is Amber Tucker. I'm a practicing CPA with Fino Della, Malone, and La Saracena, FML. And I'm also the chair of the Connecticut Society CPAs for Not-for-Profit Organization Committee. The CTCBA is a large, uh, the largest leading Connecticut professional um, organization for CPAs with almost 6,000 accounting members. Um, the CTCPA Not-for-Profit Organization Committee serves as a sounding board on current accounting, auditing, taxes, and financial reporting issues for non-for-profit organizations, and then also for those with non-for-profit clients such as myself. I'm here today to request language be added to the House Bill 5222, an act concerning paid solicitors of charitable funds and organ charitable organizations transparency. Um, this additional language would benefit the consumers of Connecticut and that more of their contributions that they're giving to the small, no, smaller not-for-profits would be able to be devoted to their mission and their programs. It would create a cost savings as audits are expensive um, for small businesses and a review, it can offer a sufficient level of comfort for Connecticut and allow organizations that need financial statements to have an option to either choose a review or an audit. Um, in the written testimony, we provided a suggested language that we would like to see added to the bill. Um, but we would greatly consider, uh, appreciate your consideration for this proposal, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay. And I, I asked this before, I think I've got it. So this is a tiered approach whereby you, you'd say up to a certain amount of, of uh, revenue for the nonprofit, they can select the full audit versus the review, and then above the million, it's still a full, full review. Correct. It would be a tier, tiered approach, which would be new. Right now, it's anything over 500,000 would require the audit. So we're just requesting that gets lift up, upgraded to a million, and then between a review and a million is the review, which is a similar approach to what I believe Massachusetts is taking. The tiered approach isn't the most common approach. Um, we felt it'd be the most um, prudent approach to take at this point. And the review is, is I mean, I don't want to, believe me, I literally got the JD and not a CPA, so I don't necessarily want to get all in the weeds of what is a, the difference between a review and an audit, but a review is still a, as it says, a review of their finance. It is a review of their financials. It is giving basically the difference, a review is providing a limited assurance where an audit is providing a reasonable amount of insurance. Um, 
really the approach is different. So review, it's it's a narrower scope of it than an audit. So we're doing an evaluation of the organization's books, but it's limited to analysis of analytical procedures, inquiry of management and staff, where an audit, we're doing that analysis, but we can't just rely on inquiry and analytics. We have to take it to the source documentation. So an audit is a little bit of the higher um, test, but it's providing more assurance where the review is providing a limited assurance. More rigorous, okay. And, and do, do CPAs, this is a little bit related, but not in this bill, but do CPAs have a, I'm just curious now, a, a program like attorneys do for pro bono services to non certain nonprofits where you can, you'll agree to do a review or an audit at a reduced fee structure or no fee structure? Right. Um, the pro bono services is really, it seems to be a gray area um, because we have to maintain our independence. Um, so it's, it doesn't say in our guidance that we're not allowed to do pro bono services. It's very, you know, we're not allowed to charge interest on late fees because that would be um, tampering with our independence. So, and we're not allowed to issue reports for fees that are outstanding. So it's a little bit gray on if we can issue a pro bono. We can prepare financial statements pro bono, but we wouldn't be able to attach an opinion to it. I understand. Okay, that's important to know. I, didn't, I did not know that. All right, well, that's helpful. Uh, that puts a little more color on that request, and I think the committee has that language. And um, I, I know we ran, I ran it by DCP, and they did not have any concerns with that either, just for the, for the committee's uh, edification. So any questions for CPA Tucker? Senator Kitzel. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, just, and your questions actually caused me to think of this further question. And I appreciate the fact that we're attorneys, not CBAs. Uh, we sort of like just sort of casually use the term audit, but God forbid, put me in front of a bunch of papers and ask me to audit them. I, I have no idea what that technically requires. But it seems to me that from what you explained that the review is something less than, but it's more than nothing. And so I'm just wondering, so I have a point of reference, where in economic society or in the flow of services in, in your profession are reviews more likely, like where would I find those so that I have a touch zone where I can say, oh, this is a new territory, it's being done over here and it's good for this, as opposed to the far more stringent and as uh, the good representative, Representative Cheeseman pointed out, the audit much more expensive too, which is a big factor, but where, where would I find reviews? That's a very good question. Um, I'm trying to think of a specific industry and I can't necessarily pinpoint one. Um, I will say, as I said in the beginning, that the tiered approach is definitely a unique approach. Um, Massachusetts is doing the review and the audit. Other states, New York um, being one of them, don't have that review. They just start at that million dollar marker and that number is, I believe, being elevated as well. Um, some banks will accept reviews instead of an audit if it, they're, you know, uh, looking for a specific risk. Um, but, but in I, the world, but in the world of CPAs, you, I mean, we're not talking about something brand new. No. Must, so you learned what a review is, and you guys can do it if you're asked to do it. There's nothing mm -hmm. novel here. Mm -mm. So I'm just wondering, like other than mirroring a little bit what Massachusetts is doing, mm -hmm. would this essentially give a break to the nonprofits that are in this 500 to $1 million range? And I'm all for cutting them some slack, especially a lot of nonprofits in my neck of the woods got hammered during the pandemic. Uh, you know, they would have fairs and the different events and those just evaporated. So if they have to pass some hurdles to continue in existence, I'm more than happy to do it. Mm -hmm. And so you feel comfortable that your professional skill set still would be utilized in a review process and that at least it would give some measure of assurance to whoever's reviewing the review. Correct. Yes. There's, there's three levels of assurance. There's the compilation where you're just compiling the statements and then there's the review where it gives you the Political, and then there's a full-blown audit. 
Um, I guess why I'm having a little bit of difficulty answering your specific question is there's not, I can't think of a specific industry that says, well, I just want reviews. You don't have to do an audit. Um, but there's all the for-profit organizations, if they don't have debt or they don't have other requirements for, for an audit, their boards or their governance may say, let's just get a review. Okay. I appreciate that. And I, I didn't even know there was a uh, compilation. So we're sort of in the middle of the back. So that's good. We are. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Very helpful. Uh, and I do not see any more questions for Ms. Tucker. So thank you very much. And thank you for being thank our you. final speaker of the day. Sam, am I lying? No, you're not lying. Okay. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, that's great. And that's our that concludes the public hearing today, committee members. We will have two more public hearings, one on Tuesday next week. Uh, one on, excuse me, three more. One on Thursday that will be devoted solely to the, uh, the privacy bill. And then two next week, uh, one on Tuesday and one on Thursday. We're splitting those up, I think. Well, we're still deciding that. that maybe, maybe we'll do them all on Monday. But the only things left to do after privacy on Thursday will be uh, the cannabis and liquor bills. We've got some the social equity proposals on the cannabis side uh, and some committee proposals uh, that members have wanted brought forward on cannabis and then DCP liquor bills and some very minor committee uh, liquor proposals as well. So I'm hoping maybe we can combine them all to one, but if we can't, we'll space them over two. And then please reserve the 15th and 17th for. Uh, our, our days to JFS and JF bills out. Committee deadline's the 22nd, but we'd like to finish early if we can. Uh, we will make sure that you have JFS language, obviously, before, before those meetings. And we're already working on that with respect to the bills we've already heard and have heard today. So that's, that's a look at the current schedule. Um, Sam, I'm right on that, right? We've got this Thursday and then at least one next week, maybe two. I'm hoping we can get it done with just one next week. Yes, from the last time you talked to me, you would definitely want to do the 15th, 17th for JF, JFS thing and public hearings. Um, you, one, I'll talk, we'll talk, we'll talk, we'll talk off screen um, about bringing the two words, combining everything. Great. Terrific. Okay. Uh, all right. Any other questions or comments from committee members? All right. Thank you all for the public hearing today. Appreciate it. Thank you. For Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair.